everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Universe Within podcast. This episode of the show is being sponsored by the Amazonian Plant Healing Center, the Temple of the Way of Light. It's a place I've worked at for probably the past decade now, so I can really attest to the quality of the work they do. Uh, they are a plant healing system working with traditional Amazonian medicine, predominantly with the Shipibo tradition. Uh, and they run 12-day retreats, working with six ceremonies. Um, they have uh, four different healers, curanderos, doctors, uh, predominantly working with ayahuasca and also a host of other plants that really help to support that, that being the catalyst. Uh, and it's a really amazing container to go really deeply into this work, to experience the, the wisdom, the teaching, the healing that these traditional plants really have to offer. Um, there's an amazing support staff, uh, facilitators there, teachers, massage people, bone doctors, herbalists. So it's a really amazing environment to go and to experience deeply this work. So uh, if that interests you, uh, they're supposed to be opening in June of this year. Unfortunately, with the pandemic, they've been shut down since March of 2020, but hopefully they'll be up and running again in the not too distant future. So if you'd like more information on them, you can check out their website at templeofthewayoflight.org, and I'll put a link in the show notes for that. Um, also, my friend and colleague, Marav Artsy, and I will be continuing to run dietas, which is kind of one of the traditional ways that people really also begin to experience the healing and the teaching and the learning from these plants. It's a period of going into isolation, really restricting one's lifestyle and ingesting these particular plants, which are considered master plants or teacher plants. And they really have the ability to, to teach and to heal us in all of these different layers of physical, mental, emotional, and, and spiritual. Um, so if you'd like more information on that, you can check out my website at nicotine rustica.org and also Marav's site at tobaccodiets.com and there'll be a link in the show notes of that as well. My guest for today is uh, Tree Carr. Tree was introduced to me by a mutual friend of ours, Luis, and uh, we had a really amazing interview. I think it went close to four hours, three and a half hours, uh, and we got into some really interesting topics. Um, for me, as I mentioned, two of the really common motifs in this world of, of, of plants and medicine and shamanism, uh, these two really common themes are dreams and death. Uh, I think really the shamanic world could potentially even be summed up with those two words, uh, entering the dream state and really going deeply into this idea of death. And so she's a really interesting person because that's exactly her work. She's a death doula, so she really helps to facilitate uh, people who are going through the, the dying process, and she does a lot of work with dreams. So we had a really fascinating conversation. We got into a, really, uh, a lot of really interesting topics. Uh, I really enjoyed speaking with her. She has a beautiful way of expressing herself and, and taking sometimes these little bit esoteric or out there ideas and bringing them into really simple ways. So I think you all will really enjoy this episode. As always, if you are enjoying the podcast and the episodes, um, if you're able to support, that's a really big help. Patreon is a really good way. It's a subscription service for as little as a dollar a month. You can uh, sign up. There's different tiers you can sign up for and uh, kind of this idea of reciprocity by giving, you also get something back. So uh, getting things back like early access to shows, Q and A's, bonus material, um, there's like four or five different tiers and that's a really big help to me to be able to bring on these amazing guests like tree. Uh, there's also the option of direct donating via PayPal. There'll be a link uh, to both of those in the show notes. And if you're not able to do that, simply going on the YouTube channel, if you're watching the video version, subscribing to the show, uh, turning on the notification bell, liking the video, that's a really big help. Um, any comments or anything, feel free to leave those in the comments section. And then with the audio version going on Apple Podcasts, also subscribing to the show and leaving a starred rating and a review, all of that is really helpful in getting this show out uh, to a bigger and broader audience and helping with those interesting algorithms. So thank you guys for tuning in. I really hope you enjoy this episode. And without further ado, here is my interview with Tree.
great. Looks like we're recording. <laughs> well, welcome. So um, we were just talking a little bit before we started uh, recording. We, we have a mutual friend, uh, Luis. He, he introduced you to me. And um, so maybe we can start, uh, you know, maybe some of the people listening to this have heard of you. I, I would imagine potentially some have, potentially some haven't. So maybe we can just start a, a little bit about your, your background, like, uh, you know, where you're from, what got you interested in the work you're doing, how that came about. Because it's always interesting. Uh, I find there's often some interesting like through lines with how people came to this work. And uh, so it's always interesting to hear a little bit about uh, people's journey that led them to this. Yeah, it's true, isn't it? When you when you pull the string all the way back to the beginning, when, yeah. and you yeah. see all the different places that you 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 know roads you could have gone off on, and the tangents you could have followed. Um, I think for me, the the base note of all my explorations has been the awareness of consciousness and the exploration of consciousness itself. And some of my earliest childhood memories are of of the observation of my own consciousness, mm -hmm. uh, observing nature, observing like my hands. I remember like staring at my toes and my feet for ages as a little kid as well. And, and just being very aware that I was this thing that was alive and experiencing itself. But a lot of times I would feel very disassociated from my limbs, so to speak, you know, just looking down at my feet and just thinking, I'm a strange little pinky gummy creature. This is so weird. <laughs> and I remember being really aware of that. Um, and also as a really little uh, child as well, I was really quite connected to my dreams. And I remembered my dreams almost more than I remember just the day-to-day -day stuff. So I was having pretty profound dreams I think as a young little child like lucid dreaming and these liminal states like out-of-body states that I felt really resonate they really stay with me in my memory um, but my my formative years were unusual in the sense that I wasn't raised with television and with uh, outside distractions or technology um, being a child of the 70s. So I was born in the early 70s. I was born in 1972. And my formative years were on a commune in a communal setting. And so, yeah, there was no technology. There was nothing like watching, sitting in front of a television, watching it for ages and whatnot, or even pop culture for that matter. So it was more uh, sort of innocent, uh, upbringing in a sense, probably more like sheltered. I'd use the word sheltered probably more than innocent. <laughs> it was more sheltered. And so the access to nature and to play and to creativity and to daydreaming and being lost in imagination and observation was pretty big. And it was, of course, I didn't think of that at the time because I was just a little kid and you're not thinking of these things. Um, but in retrospect, looking back, I can see that that really helped build a foundation for uh, everything that I'm doing now and all of the things that have led me down my path into the various things that I do. Mm. So that would be the, you know, the base note. So I grew up in the United States and also in Canada as well. Uh, moved around a lot and seemed to be moving every seven years a lot um, and moved to the UK, uh, emigrated here to the UK in 1999. So I spent most of seemingly like I'm spending most of my life over here in the United Kingdom. It's certainly the one place that I've kind of like doom, landed, <laughs> just stuck. Uh, and it's really interesting because I spent my whole life feeling like I never was quite home. I never felt like I belonged anywhere, never really felt like you know, connect. I always felt like I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. And uh, moving to the UK, the first night I slept here, when I was here in the UK, I was like, wow, this is so weird. I feel like I've come home in May. Um, and that's strange because I've never had, I've never been an Anglophile and it wasn't anything that I felt like 
I, I obsessed with England or the UK or Britain or anything. I do have, of course, my DNA is from here, <laughs> but so maybe it's more to do with that than anything, um, uh, anything that's surfacey. But yeah, that's kind of like that's sort of my background in in a sense. Um, I think uh, coming from a background of the creative arts too is probably a big part of my journey as well uh, as a musician. And so uh, these are all, all of these threads can be pulled all the way back to the very beginning. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, you, you mentioned some really common motifs. Uh, this idea of like consciousness and being really curious about that, uh, you know, the, the, even these ideas of like observation, like looking at our hands and <laughs> just thinking like, what is going on? What is this? And um, you also mentioned this idea that I find really interesting, which is this idea of coming home. And I think a lot of people who are drawn to this work that that seems to be one of the really common motifs of, 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 of plant work, of dream work is this idea of trying to come home, like this longing for for home, for peace, for 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 the womb. So I know I know of you. You you do a lot of work with dreams. You're you're also a death doula. Can you talk a bit about your work and uh, kind of that work of, of of the dream world of death doula? You know, these things are are very interesting because they're I think they're so important and you know, a lot of, a lot of the people listening to this podcast are, are interested in working with plants and in different levels in terms of herbalism or shamanic plants. Um, but I mean, two of the really common motifs in this kind of shamanic world are, are those two ideas of dreaming and death. <laughs> I mean, if it had to be boiled down, it would probably be those two, those two words. So it, it's very interesting because it seems like your work is, is very much in those two realms. Yeah. And, you know, the, it's funny, the work that I've done in both of these realms, I never really like joined the dots really until I was much older and I was working in both of these realms like not officially uh being called like, let's say being called being called into both of these realms as a as a child and the dream exploration was happening on one end and the death stuff was happening on the other end and they were both going along their way and it wasn't until I was the age of 40 that they merged together and it all kind of came together in a eureka moment. So when I was a child, I was working with, well, not working with, because was I was just experiencing my dreams and uh, very much took them seriously. In fact, my family is very uh, open to talking about dreams. So when I had interesting experiences uh, with lucid dreaming or out-of-body states, it was very easy to talk to my folks about it. Both my parents um, have had interesting experiences in their dream states uh, from, you know, precognitive dreams, uh, being able to uh, have these other sensitivities in the dream states. And so that felt like just a natural progression. And then as I became a teenager, my own pre precognitive dreams started to take shape. And that became kind of quite mind blowing at the time. and and made me very inquisitive and it also sort of blew apart my concept of the nature of reality and the nature of time and how time worked and all of these things and started to trust the process through my own practice which was journaling and and engaging with my dreams and of course along the way I've, I've you know I had a, a best friend at the time in high school who helped uh, me along my path too, because he had very similar experiences. His name was Ren. Uh, he, he died uh, five years ago. And so with having an, this exploration really helped move forward that practice, and then also working with, you know, the plants as well. And plants have always been a big part of my, my uh, life in a way since I was a little, little child. I, I remember uh, collecting mushrooms and I remember uh, being with certain flowers and plants and had favorite trees 
that I would climb and stay with. And in fact, when I've gone back to childhood places of where I've lived, uh, the first thing that I'm interested in going to see are the trees and the plants that were once that were there that I could remember. It's not so much the house or what, what you know, the neighborhood. It's I go back to the trees and I'm like, oh, wow, I used to climb this and I climb it again. And, you know, so I have a, a really big connection to the, the plants alongside all of this in my life. And it wasn't until I was uh, a teenager that I started, you know, using them a bit more as you do, you know, experimentation with various mind altering, conscious altering um, substances and also some of the dreaming plants. So working with Wanirogens, which are dreaming plants and herbs that are, are little green allies that help to open up the dream space and to activate dreams and expand our consciousness in these liminal states. So I was doing that all alongside uh, as I was exploring uh, as a teenager. And it wasn't until I was... Um, I guess it would have been just before the age of 40. So I'm like turning 49. So yeah, nearly a decade ago where I felt um, uh, called to go a little bit deeper with plant work, working with plant medicines. And it was actually ayahuasca that told me in a conversation through a journey to step out as a dreaming guide. And I was like, what? Does that even exist? And she was like, she showed me how to do it. She said, you need to put, because I dream journal, I've done my own practice since I was a teenager. So she showed me images of my dream journal, like, you know, pictures of my dream journal up on social media. And at this time it was Facebook. This was before Instagram was like the hot ticket. So I, was, I thought I was having this conversation with her <laughs> saying like, why would I put my dreams up on Facebook? That is so cringe. Are you kidding me? That is like, why would ever anyone want to read my dream? And isn't that egotistical? Like that seems weird. Why would you instruct me to do that and guide me to do that? And she said, no, trust me. It's not egotistical. This is part of the collective. People can uh, connect to your dreams because they've experienced similar. And then I had this vision of like, uh, like all of my dream journal <laughs> entries <clears throat> on social media. And then all these like golden souls like flying in towards like responding, responding to the dreams. And I, it was so profound. And it wasn't just the visual that was profound. It was just the knowing that, wow, this could help people. And it seems important. So I said, okay, that's my homework, uh, as, as well as a whole bunch of other stuff that she told me to do. I decided, okay, I'll start doing that. I did it, I just did it within days of that. And I started posting my uh, dream journal entries. So a photograph of an old journal and, and I would choose the weird, the weird ones too, the weird dreams, not, not anything that was mundane. It was, you know, the out of body states sleep paralysis states, uh, visions around the bed, uh, lucid dreaming, all of these styles of dreams. So I thought I'm going to put the far out weird stuff up there because that's what I'm feeling like I'm drawn to do. So as soon as I started doing that, <clears throat> uh, what ayahuasca told me and predicted would happen started to happen. So Basically, I started getting lots of people messaging me saying, I used to lucid dream when I was a little kid. I'd love to do it again. Or I get sleep paralysis. I'm so scared. How can I make it stop? Or how can I navigate this? Or um, I left my body and I'm afraid. How do I navigate this? So I started to help people uh, through messaging uh, and giving them tips and guidance on how to, how to navigate these liminal states. And it got so busy uh, on my end that I decided, you know what, I think I'm going to start a workshop because then I could get everybody in the same room at the same time. And then I don't have to be typing so much. <laughs> so I guess it's a bit selfish on my part. But also I was really fascinated that there was people who would come together and I was like, I want to bring this ayahuasca vision to, you know, to fruitation and bring it all together. Um, 
fruition, sorry, fruitation. I just made up a new word. <laughs> so that's how the dream started. And alongside all of this too, I've had my foot in the death realm as well. So uh, yes, fr so from a very young age, uh, having uh, deaths in my life uh, growing up, um, but feeling quite unusually comfortable about it and not in a, in a uh, sociopathic way, but I mean, in a way where I felt like I understood what death was. Uh, my mom explaining my grandfather dying to me when I was five, and he was a wonderful man, uh, such a wonderful Scottish Glaswegian um, guy. He, he died quite young for a grandpa. And um, when she told me he died, I had just a real sense of calm and knowing about it. Um, it didn't, it didn't really, I think it might have shocked my mom a bit, possibly, because I was just so calm about it, uh, that I understood that he, he you know, he transist, he, was, he did a transition. And moving forward in my life, I always felt drawn to uh, death, uh, not in a morbid way, um, but in a fascinated way, in a way where I felt like I wanted to understand it and I wanted to be around it. I wanted to unpack it. I wanted to know its mysteries, but I also wanted to be around grief as well. I wanted to understand this taboo. So when I became a teenager, I started to ask my mom if I could come with her to funerals. Uh, there would be, you know, deaths in the family or deaths of friends of family. And uh, my mom would be there, you know, going to the funeral or the wake. And I, I'd say, can I come with you? Even if I didn't even know the person, I just wanted to be around that. And I wanted to be around the process of grief and the rituals around it too. So the wakes, uh, viewing the body, you know, the whole thing. I wanted to know it. Um, in fact, when I was five at my, my, my grandfather's funeral, uh, he had an open weight casket. I felt really comfortable, uh, like just going, like holding his hand as he was in the casket. I remember to the shock of my older, like his Scottish uh, family coming over going, you can't do that. You can't, you can't touch him. But it just felt like normal to me. Um, so I wanted to be around that as a teenager, uh, which I was, and I'd have big conversations about my mom with my mom about it. And around that time too, my parents were doing like compassion work uh, for old folks' homes. So they would every uh, weekend they would go visit a local old folks' home, and they would uh, visit and hang out with old people. And my, my parents are musicians. I'm from a very musical family. So they play, you know, instruments. My dad sings and plays guitar. And so I would come with them for that. And I would help and sometimes I'd play the keyboard. And like, um, I would also like have conversations with like some of the really old people who just no one's visiting them, you know? And I always felt so, it was strange whenever we went there because I would feel so heartbroken. I, I would really be holding back the tears a lot of the times. I would feel like so much grief, but at the same time, so much love and calm as well. But I, I really felt a burden in my heart for a lot of, the, of these people. And my heart was just cracking open all the time, you know, with empathy. And... So these sort of things are happening in my life alongside my dreaming. And then it was when I was age 17, this unusual phenomenon started happening <laughs> to me where I always happened to be at the right place at the right time uh, in public when there was some kind of accident or tragedy that occurred. And I would be there to, there helping uh, with emergency situations. And when I say uncanny, I mean like, you know, up to four times a year, like a lot. Um, first time it happened, I was 17 and it was a motorcycle accident where we, me and my friend Ren witnessed uh, this guy get smashed by a truck 
launched off his motorcycle and running over to make sure he was okay. But of course we knew CPR and first aid, you know, from Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts and whatnot, but we knew we, we, we shouldn't take his helmet off and we shouldn't move him. So it was like a matter of holding the guy's hand while my friend ran, ran and, and called 911 from uh, someone's house. Cause it's, this is in the late eighties, it's before mobile phones. <laughs> So being with this guy who clearly was completely knocked out, he was, you know, he was breathing and uh, coming, coming in and out of lucidity and just giving him, you know, calm words of don't worry, everything's going to be okay and help is on its way. That's, that moment was the first of many, many moments that, that happened every single year about you know three times a year from the ages of 17 all the way to the age of 40 when I had a eureka moment. So all of these strange events involved either people collapsing at my feet, uh, having seizures, I've had uh, people trapped, like hit by a bus right in front of me, trapped under the wheels. And I'm there like, wow, with this guy like crushed under the wheels. Uh, more motorcycle accidents where um, I'm holding the guy's hand, helping him breathe through the pain before the, <laughs> before the ambulance arrives. I've done CPR on people who are like completely out, uh, you name it. I mean, it's just so many, it's uncanny. And it got to the point where a lot of, it became a long running joke with many of my friends where they would say, oh my God, every time we hang out with you, someone's down, someone goes down. And I was like, and, and I kept feeling like, is it me? I felt like, am I kind of some kind of witch that's making this stuff happen? And I'm like, no, no, because I, I'm there, I'm helping them. So obviously it can't be bad, right? And uh, this is happening all through my life. Um, all one, one situation, I've told this story many times, but this one's even the craziest. It's like on the street of London on Carnaby Street, walking down Carnaby Street, very busy, busy like weekend. And there's this man in front of me and he's walking, we're all walking and he just stops dead in his tracks right in front of me. So of course I stop, so I don't bump into him. And as he stops, he just starts to like fall backwards. It seemed like really slow motion. And he just fell back into me. I thought, is this some kind of joke? Like those sort of trust, uh, you know, those trust <laughs> tasks where people fall into you. And I captured him, I caught him and he was going down and totally passed out. And we noticed, I was with my partner at the time that he had just uh, injected heroin and he literally ODing and he was in my arms. And I, you know, I was just like, this is just too crazy. I'm in the right place at the right time, a lot of the time. And we were able to call the paramedics and they came very quickly and saved that guy's life which was amazing. So all of these things are happening in synchronistic ways all since the age of 17. And here I'm at like age 40. That was my big year. 40 was a big year. And not only was it, you know, ayahuasca and so many other things, but uh, I stepped into my role as a death doula. So how I stepped into my role as a death doula was another weird, uncanny, synchronistic occasion in London, walking down Broadway Market. And it was a beautiful, beautiful October sunny mo morning. And as I was walking through the crowded market with my partner, I noticed this guy, this, this kind of heavy set, bigger guy. And he was uh, he, he's stumbling a bit. I thought, oh, he doesn't look like he's doing okay. And he, and he really stumbled, he was leaning against the wall. So I decided to, you know, hey, are you okay? Do you want to come and have a seat? Do you want to sit down? And by the time I went over there, he was like really kind of crumbling. So it was like, oh, well, let's just try to help him out. And he was going over basically. So then many of us came over and helped to support him. And he was having some, something was happening. I was like, his face was, churning purple and he it, I mean I don't, I'm not a medic I'm not a nurse I'm not a paramedic but I was like this guy it looks like he's having a heart attack I mean 
that's my that was my impression and it was it was true he was having a cardiac, a cardiac arrest so he went down so it was really just for scrambling uh doing cpr you know doing everything that we could to to keep him because he was losing his breath it was like he was choking it was it was terrible and turning color and scrambling to get on 999 and so as we were all taking turns on his in my lap i was holding his hands and while everyone was taking turns i just kept just saying these words of comfort you're not alone uh help is on its way you're not alone i just really so i you know i just knew he was i knew he was gonna die i knew he was dying it was just a big knowing and in these cir circumstances i've never freaked out or stressed or afraid it's like i just click into the zone the zone of just right let's just you know find some peace and let's bring it into the moment you really get in the present moment in these state these states of emergency with people it's like everything stops and you're just it's just you and that person in the process so um you know he didn't make it so we were scrambling to really help him and even like someone got a liberator in the gp just across the street because the ambulance to be honest took 30 minutes it was a long time and he had died much sooner than when they came so witnessing his death which was really uh um difficult in the sense that you know we tried everything we could do and yet it wasn't enough but the moment his death was really quite profound because his eyes were open and they were transfixed and he was looking up into the sky and his eyes were just looking up while we were trying to give him comfort and still trying to give him mouth to mouth and his eyes it was like he could see something that's all i could think of because there was just tears streaming from his eyes which i'll never forget and I, you know it just kept thinking like what did what did he see did he see something or was he moved to tears because he knew he was transitioning he was knew he was dying but that you know left a really big impact just the clarity and also the fact that he just seemed to have a lot of clarity in his eyes itself just will, will re always really stay with me and so that that morning you know in that situation was just full on eventually the par the paramedics arrived uh, and worked on him for like a long time with the you know for liberator and zapping him uh which which was really harrowing in many ways because you know we we saw his death and we experienced it um, and at that time too, he had a family that was walking ahead and they didn't realize that he had fallen back. So his mother, his daughter, and his wife at one point realized that, hey, where's dad? Where did he go? We can't find him. And so, so came looking for him through the market and found this scene um, with all the paramedics and everything. And of course, they were absolutely shocked and uh, wailing and freaking out. And so I went over to them and I comforted them and I stayed with them and I was like hugging them. Total strangers were all hugging, <laughs> all three of them. And you know, his mom was like, "It should have been me. It should have been me. I'm older." And it was really like full on. And so I stayed with them the whole time uh, for that afternoon. I left that whole day that, you know, obviously that became the day that changed everything too. And felt like, wow, why does this keep happening? Like many of the people that I've helped over the years, of course they survived, but this, you know, I just, it was a real, okay, the universe, what's going on? So uh, <laughs> I decided to ask my dreams that night. Uh, hey, why does this keep happening? Because I'm getting the complex here beginning to feel like, <laughs> and I, I never felt drawn to becoming a nurse or, you know, anything in, in that, you know, in that realm at all, like anything medical. So I asked my dreams and before I woke up, 
I was in the hypnopompic state, which is a really beautiful liminal state where you can receive some amazing insights if you pay attention and your awareness is peaked. So in that state, I got a quick succession of every single person that I seem to have been there for and um, right time at the right place kind of thing. And it just hit me this eureka moment. These things have been happening because this is where you're meant to be. And you're meant to step into this role. And so I woke up and I thought, what is this role? Because it's clearly not a paramedic. Like it's, it, and that, that's quite clear because it felt like everything that I was able to offer a lot of these people who were in these, uh, you know, accidents or these health crises was like a, an emotional support it was like a presence of course you know you know helping with cpr and helping them to get their mind off the pain is was helpful but if i was to whittle it down to its true essence what i was doing was i was holding space for these people in times of crisis and fear and the time of like close to feeling afraid of dying and you know that sort of thing so i thought is there a a uh, role or an occupation that involves emotional support around death or around fear of dying. And so I decided to use old Google because Google is like the best Oracle out there at the moment. <laughs> so I got into Google and I just typed in a variety of words, uh, emotional support at death. And the death doulas came up and I was like, a do what? <laughs> and I was like, I had to Google that word too. I found out it's an ancient Greek word for a woman who serves. And of course, there's birth doulas. And I was like, of course, birth doula. And I saw the death doulas. So a, a midwife, a, a, a person who helps, uh, who is at service to help hold space and presence in a compassionate way around death, dying, and the fear of it, and also just the transitioning of it. And I just, I just started to like vibrate with like, yes, like I finally know what I want to be when I grow up kind of vibe, <laughs> you know, because that was one thing I always struggled with too. What, what am I going to be? Who am I? What am I? I don't know. So uh, I never turned back. I was on that website for the training and signed up or sent to email straight away. Can I get on to the next course? And that was it. Uh, three, three year training doing that. And uh, so I never looked back. So that was a big year for me when I turned 40 because I had those two realms of dreams and death merged together. And the big kind of oh, walking into uh, working in those realms, uh, stepping into my, my role, I guess, uh, it was kind of a important time too, because I was turning 40, you know, when you turn 40, it's like, wow, I'm going into middle age now. And, you know, as a woman too, it's like 40, it's, it seems like I'm turning into an older, an older human and my youth is gone. And, and I just saw it as a real initiation, you know, and turning 40 was like stepping into my, my magic and what I'm meant to do. And so those two realms of dreams and death for me merged because I realized as well through working with the plant medicines too, was that they are similar spaces. They're both liminal. They both hold great mystery and they both hold a, a different state of consciousness as well. When we're sleeping, our consciousness is shifted and changed into this more, uh, we get into the more unconscious realms and we get into more connected realms. And death is a similar too. Uh, when someone is actively dying and when someone has died, there's a shift that occurs. And there's interesting phenomenon that occurs as well around it. So I, I you know, the coin dropped, so to speak. Um, and I never looked back. So <laughs> moving forward, um, those are the two realms I mostly work with, dreams and death, as well as divination too. And that's a whole other topic, uh, which was also another thread that was following my lifeline too. 
um, which involves a lot of the esoteric arts uh, like tarot and working with intuition and mediumship and clairvoyancy. And all of that started to click as well. So 40 was a big year for me. <laughs> Needless to say, some people feel like, oh no, I'm turning 40. And then, uh, and then you get this, this huge thing happening. But I gotta say, you know what? Um, my biggest teacher with death, I know going through the training and getting certification is great, but my biggest teacher for death was ayahuasca. It's because, you know, Wow, uh, she showed me a lot in how to hold space more than any kind of training would. I, I would recommend the training, of course. It was it's brilliant, it's amazing and fantastic. But yes, uh, my biggest teacher is a plant when it comes to death. Uh, so many um, journeys with ayahuasca, really bringing that in and really helping me deepen the role. So yeah, plants have been with me all alongside the dream work and the death work. And, um, and I'd like to introduce people to these, these fantastic allies as well through the process. I just talked so much. <laughs> I just feel, you know, when you talk and you're just like, no, no, and it's just stop now. <laughs> you're so patient. <laughs> Oh, that, that was amazing. There, there, there's a ton there I'd, I'd love to talk about and explore. One of the first things that comes to mind is you mentioned this idea of, of kind of space holding and, and just being there for someone, which seems like a really simple thing. And yet, um, you know, in, in, in my work, for example, working with ayahuasca, that's a that's a huge part of it is, you know, just that idea of being there with someone. But I found it interesting because the question that arose is in, in, in my work, what I find part of that idea of space holding is again, really being there for someone, but it, it also comes from a very experiential place of like, I may not know exactly what that person is going through, but through doing the work on myself, I have an idea and I have an idea that they're going to be okay. And, and it's not kind of like a, an idea that they're going to be okay. It's like a real knowing of like, oh yeah, like I've been there. I, I myself, I, I, I've seen that in others and, and it is a process and it's leading somewhere. And so, you know, there's a genuine, like you're going to be okay. Like I, I recognize where you are and the, the thing that came up that was really interesting is there's this saying in Zen and, and the, the student asked the teacher, he goes, uh, so what happens when you die? And the, the teacher looks at him and he goes, I don't know. <laughs> and the, the student goes, well, how do you not know you're a Zen master? And he said, yeah, but I'm not a dead Zen master. <laughs> and so like one of the, the question that comes to mind is, when you're holding that space, and I guess you kind of answered it in, in that your a lot of your teaching came via ayahuasca, but where where do you think for you that that compassion or that knowing arises, you know, that, that someone is okay? Is it just something that you sense? You you've seen that through your experience, like you mentioned that clarity in the eyes, that actually something beautiful is happening. Uh, just the, the, the time you spend around people dying, there, there's something in you that intuitively knew that like, it's going to be okay. When you're holding that space, like, because death is, you, you mentioned this idea of like this mystery, you know, and it's something that, that I think to some degree, none of us exactly know. We, we may have experiences and I think certainly plant medicine is, as you said, an amazing way the the last interview I did was with a, a guy named Roman, and we were actually talking about this, how all of this plant work, all of these initiation rites are preparing us for death, uh, that essentially that's what they're doing. So uh, I guess that's kind of a long-winded question, but but for you, where does that, where does kind of that sense of, of compassion or knowing come from when you're holding that space uh, that, that someone is okay in, in that ultimate sense? And and, and how do you really navigate that and, and, and share that with them? Um, which I guess also goes into like, what exactly does a death doula do? What does that look like? What is that experience like? Uh, Cause I'm sure some people have ideas about that, but 
I think until one really experiences that or sees that, it's it's maybe a bit of a foreign concept as well. Yeah, so the role of the death doula, it can, I mean, you take on many different aspects. It can be emotional support, psychological support, and then, of course, spiritual support, depending on the person's cosmology or openness and, and practical support, too. But getting back to your question about is it going to be okay and how people, how, how to navigate that and the compassion that arises that makes you feel that you step into the knowing that everything is going to be okay. So where does that come from? I, I think it comes from the, the boundary dissolving nature of shifting into a consciousness that is beyond ego construct. And it's a difficult one to articulate unless you've kind of been there, I guess, I, I suppose, but we've all been there in, in, in varying places. You know, some people get there through uh, meditation. Some people get there through a psychedelic experience. Some people get there through the death of, of a loved one. Others get there through the birth of their first child. There's a boundary dissolving moment where you realize there's much more than this story called me, tree, or, you know, uh, me, Jason. So it's like getting beyond that. So when I hold space for other people, when it comes to anything around death, uh, and also in any other kind of sessions I do too, I try to step into that shift of consciousness that's beyond the ego construct. So I guess some people would call it the unified oneness or the, uh, the connecting to the logos or however you would define it. It feels as that holding space for another person through the process of dying is holding them within that space. So it's beyond the ego. So you're not there trying to say the right things. You're not there trying to say, to make it better or to placate anything. You're there in complete acceptance and surrender and openness. And you're there tapping into that bigger connectivity and pulling it into the space for them. Now, it's up to the person how they want to navigate it. Like I know we, you know, we're all dying and we're all going to die, but we can, we have a choice in how we want to approach that. Uh, of course, we have no choice in how it's going to happen. <laughs> For some of us, it might be many, many years from now. Some it might be through illness, and some it might be through accident. But we do have a choice on how we are going, what kind of attitude we're going to have around it. So the biggest thing is that many people before they die, they experience an ego disillusion, like an ego death, or, you know, they start going through the throes of an ego death. And I personally, I find that that's the one thing that people really struggle with the most, more than the fact that they're ill uh, or they're uncomfortable. It is the whole ego disillusion of who am I? What am I? What was I? What was it all about? And really coming to like, you know, this sort of existential crisis as to what they are. They're like, I'm dying. You know, I used to be a successful solicitor or I was like a famous artist or whatever they were. They, they're like, and that doesn't matter. Like, I'm going to die. <laughs> you know, I think famously Steve Jobs like struggled with that. He struggled really hard with that. Um, you know, here we are, like a, he was a massive billionaire and very successful and he couldn't not beat his cancer. And it was, that was it. It's like, it, now you're, it's time to go. And he, he really struggled with that. And so with the ego death, you can navigate it either through 
uh, a surrender to it and like just moving through it and, and coming into some kind of individuation or some kind of integration through the process and you come out the other side like like almost at peace with yourself or you can fight it the whole way until your final last breath and you know so we have this incredible choice on how we're going to navigate those you know those final those final moments are we going to go out with death rows are we going to uh you know surrender to the, the mystery and so it's challenging too to hold space for people uh, sometimes when they are struggling with it and they don't want to leave and they're pissed off uh, my my teacher one of my teachers of my death doula uh teachers she had an amazing story of a, a younger man who was you know probably like early 40s so not very old for for his terminal illness and he had a young family and she was holding space for him the death doula through his dying process and even though he was quite a i guess considered person like you know quite into uh, spiritual paths and whatnot he went out kicking and screaming he was really pissed off and she said it was the hardest thing because you know they're there trying to hold space of compassion and he's like cussing and swearing and having a fit you know on his deathbed like really pissed off so i mean we have a choice on how we want to how we're going to go out so the challenge with the death doula is, you know, when you see people in peril like that, that you of course want to fix it and make it better and be like, it's going to be okay. You know, say, the, say these things. It's going to be all right. Everything is fine. But um, there's nothing that you can say. Just holding that compassionate presence can sometimes be enough. But at the end of the day, we all have a choice on how we want to face our final moments of our body uh, collapsing. And this is the great beauty of it all, I think, too. I know that sounds a bit strange, but I think I've you know seen enough positive experiences to know that there's something there must be there's something, it feels like there's something more. I mean, there's a lot of understudied data out there on deathbed phenomena that would really bring into this whole question of like, yeah, does the consciousness survive after, after the, the corporal body dies? And, and there's some cool stuff, like even with my grandmother, um, my granny who passed away, uh, she, she was married to the Scottish, the Scottish grandpa that I was talking about. So she passed like uh, in 2012 and she had a beautiful passing and really lucid and without medication and, and whatnot. And she, she passed away uh, sitting up in the bed with loved ones around her. And when she died, she died with her eyes open and her eyes changed color, which was absolutely cool and very unusual and wild. Uh, so she's got very, very blue, sparkling blue eyes, and she died with her eyes open, and her eyes turned like this most amazing, like violet color, like a purpley color. Uh, and so things like that make me feel like, you know, there's kind of more to it than we know. Uh, I've got so many stories like this, you know, or the deathbed phenomenon of visions around the deathbed. Um, also, my teacher, again, the teacher who was, I was talking about with this, um, one of her clients that she was holding space for, the one in the death rows who just really didn't want to go, who was cussing on and cursing on the way out. Well, she had this other friend that she had a friend she was holding space for uh, during our training. And she came into our class one day and she told us, oh, he passed away last night. And we were like, oh, we're so sorry. And she said, no, it was really beautiful. And every, you know, they were there holding space for him. He died at home. And then she said the most unusual thing happened. She said, right after he died, 
like literally within five minutes, the room was filled with all around him was with this really tangible mist that we could see. And we're like, no way. And she's like, yes. And I took photos and she, she showed us on her iPhone and she took like about 70 photos. And she said, I took so many because I want to show that it's not like, like there wasn't a fault on this, on the lens of my camera. She also had taken pictures like of the other parts of the, of the room just to show that, you know, that this tangible mist was around his body um, to show that like, look, it's not the tr a trick of the light or the camera, or there's not smudge on the, <laughs> there's nothing smudged on the camera, on the camera lens. And there was in the pictures, amazing, like ethereal mist all around him. And uh, from loads of different vantage points, he had a very calm, like very peaceful, look on his face I mean it, this stuff is like it happens and it's understudied and it's not talked about much um as well as dreams becoming more vivid and uh, you know ancestors coming through in the dreams to say that they're going to come and collect them in a couple of days and so many things like this um that happen in around the time of death so getting back to your question, when you, you feel like everything is going to be okay and you feel like there's a knowing, yeah, it is going to be okay. And I think sometimes this deathbed phenomenon happens in order to assure us that, look, it's, it's, it's all right. It's going to be okay. Uh, and it also brings great comfort to those who are dying as well when they have a visitation, either through the dream or through a vision uh, by the bed. Uh, so, but we have a choice on how we want to, it's just like birth too, you know, the mom, the mother has a choice. You know, she could have it in a hot tub, she could, she could have their baby, her baby, uh, you know, in the hospital, she could have it uh, a c-section if she wanted and some two people book the c-section could have it natural she could cuss and curse the whole way through it or she could breathe through it mindfully you know we have a choice on how we want to how we want to do it how we want to embrace it so the thing is with death though it's so taboo and so not talked about that i feel that we're very ill-equipped here in the west uh, and it doesn't have to be that way. And I think a big part of the death doula movement is to bring in these basically ancient ways of being. It's just compassionate human ways of supporting each other and bringing those ways back into more compassionate settings and, and just talking about death and, and just acknowledging it instead of sweeping it under the carpet and ah, don't want to talk about it and pretend it doesn't exist. So a big part of this too is I'm a, a huge death positive advocate. So I'm very much into bringing a lot of the old practices back. And when I say old practices, I don't mean like <laughs> it's going to be like some medieval kind of like scenario where you got leeches sucking you. <laughs> You know, not nothing like that. It's just the, these more like hands-on family, you know, intimate, compassionate. So in, in times of old, family took care of their, you know, the situation. So um, people often died at home around their loved ones. The people uh, held space for them, made sure that they were cared for, made sure that they were comfortable, surrounded with them with uh, everything that they needed. And after they passed, they, they, were, they were kept at home for a few days so people could come and mourn and pay their respects. So you had time to process, cry, wail, grieve over uh, the, the body. And I think that's really healthy actually. And studies do show that those who have closure with, with the body after death are able to bounce back after their grief much quicker than someone who was not able to view the body or able to bond and cry and grieve over the body. 
So I'm very much into helping to facilitate, bring that back with the catharsis of grief. So I'm a big advocate of that, being able to cry, wail, mourn, do what you need to do uh, to, to work it out energetically out of your system. And I'm also a big advocate of, you know, uh, the, the sacred ritual of death as well, uh, washing the body, anointing the body with oil, uh, wrapping them in a shroud and, and the care, the care and the honoring as well. Instead of sending your loved one to a funeral director to be embalmed and, you know, turned into something that's not recognizable possibly. <laughs> so um, all of these things I feel very passionate about is, is bringing a lot of this information back, helping to equip people with this choice because a lot of people don't know they have this choice that you know just because you die it doesn't mean the state hat owns your body it doesn't mean that the authorities have to come all of a sudden have to come in and take you away uh that you can still be at home you can still be at home even after you passed for up to three days you're not going to turn into a zombie after you know, <laughs> when the clock stick clicks midnight. <laughs> These are all like, you know, misconceptions. People think it's just going to turn into like a horror movie, but it's not. So um, through the process of doing this too, it's, it's compassionate, it's humane, it's part of, uh, it's cathartic, it's holistic, it's therapeutic it's honoring, it's sacred, and it's profound. And connecting to these old ways of being, I think, is part of the healing, the healing process. So I'm, I'm really into helping to bring those that back uh, through this movement, which isn't, you know, people think, oh, it's a new movement, but it's like, no, these are ancient roles. We're just, we're just stepping back into them, you know? We're just it's been around for thousands of years um so yeah that's i don't know if that answered your question about is it going to be okay is everything is it going to be all right but i think um yeah i think it's going to be all right <laughs> you you mentioned this idea and it, it's something I, i've studied a bit and it seems like a a, a relatively common phenomena that when people have gone through these near-death experiences, whether they're in a car crash or a hospital bed, and they've clinically been declared dead, and somehow they are resuscitated or revived. Um, you know, interestingly, people often even describe that as like a choice, like they were given a choice whether to come back, and they, they decided to come back somehow. But something they often describe is that when they were clinically dead, <laughs> they were not dead. The, the, the consciousness was still very aware and they could even do things like describe the room, describe, you know, the, the people in the room, what they were wearing, what they were saying, the, 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 the feeling, the energy. And <clears throat> so that seems like such a, such a valuable thing, like you were saying, that we do kind of, once someone is dead, we like roll them out and, and put them away. And yet there's still something alive there in a way. There's, there's still a process that's being undertaken. And I, I remember it was really interesting because you talked about this idea that, that often in the West, we, we have a very, I don't know what the word is, strange relationship with death. Like you said, we we want to kind of wipe it under the cover. Even so much of our culture is built around youth and 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 idealizing that. And I mean, you know, it. I even find it funny. Like you look at social media and it, it's predominantly younger people giving their opinions and their beliefs and and like, you know, I think about things like, you know, Star Wars or a lot of these ancient traditions. And there's this idea of like, you know, a council of the elders. And it seems like we've forgotten about that inherent wisdom in, in aging and death and, and what that brings. And one of the things that came to mind is I remember, I think I was in like uh, middle school and I had this really interesting computer science teacher. It was right when computer science had come out. And 
uh, he was, he was very different from all of my teachers. He had like this long ponytail and he was kind of a dork, but he would get in street fights. And he, so he was like kind of a hero for me. I was like, this guy's amazing. He's like smart and tough. And <laughs> but he came in one day and he was like super shiny and happy. He was always drinking his coffee in the morning and he'd like talk to us for 15 minutes before class started. And he said his friend had died. And I was just thinking, well, that's really strange. Why is he so happy? <laughs> and it turned out that he and his friends had all gotten together and they had celebrated his death. You know, they, they all ate together and they, they recounted stories and they, they had a, a huge party. And, it, you know, part of me was like, well, that's really weird. That's not what people do. And yet at the same time, I just saw this beauty in it. And, you know, this, this celebration of his life and, you know, then, then as I got older and also being very curious about these ideas of death and other cultures, uh, you know, learning like in, in Tibet, they, they would take the body and they would, they would put it on the cliff and the vultures would come and, and eat all of the flesh. And then those bones, the family would take and they would use them. They would use them as like a cup to drink out of. And for so many of us, that seems like morbid and like, oh my God, like, how could you do that? That's, you know, disgracing the body. And, it, and yet at the other hand, like that seems like maybe the most honorable thing you could do with the body. And, or I remember when I was in India and in, in Varanasi and just being really almost overwhelmed by these funeral processions and, you know, like a, the, the father died and, and the, the family is, is, is doing this procession and they finally get to the, the river and the, they, they, they set the body on fire and the, the job of the eldest son is to take this, uh, this club and smash the skull of the father. And from an outside point of view, that seems like, oh my God, that's horrific. Like, why would you do that? But it's an act of love because if you don't, the, the skull will explode. So he's cracking the skull in, in a sense to release that energy so that the, the, the body can peacefully be burned and transition into this, this holy river. And so I guess my question is, you know, you mentioned this idea of, of bringing these ancient traditions back. Do you see any kind of commonalities in, in what a lot of these ancient cultures, the, the views they had around death and, you know, why potentially those, those are better than, than these ideas that we have of just kind of pushing it away, putting old people in a home, not valuing them, not valuing their opinion, just kind of this whole culture of, of really valuing youth and vitality. And, and, and what are those important characteristics that these, these traditional cultures from all over the world seem to really, you know, uh, embody or, or, or have wisdom around this death and dying process? Yeah, so I see the, the, the common threads that link a lot of these cultures that have this ritualistic process around death. Um, their common links would be catharsis, that the rituals themselves creates a form of catharsis, a processing um, of the death. And when I say processing, I mean an emotional processing of grief allowing there to be a, a physical exertion, either through um, weeping, crying, burning, chanting, singing, crushing a skull, <laughs> all of you know, these things, are that's cathartic. And that helps on an emotional level. It also helps on an energetic level. Also, it helps in a community way because everyone does this together. So it's collectively processing the depth the family, the, the friends, the loved ones around. And so there's that, which is very much um, a common thread. Uh, you even have in many traditions through uh, history and through various cultures, the death wail. So people wailing, allowing there to be a shrieking, uh, like, a, uh, like an outpouring of sound, which I think is so important. We have in the West, everyone's like stiff upper lip. They're at the funeral, holding back the tears. It's like the stifling of the emotional 
energy in the body, it's, um, it gets all stuck. <laughs> and uh, th this wailing and the shrieking is so important. And so you have it from, you know, you see it in Africa, you see it in the Middle East, in Palestine, you see um, in Indian traditions, the, the singing, the song and the crying, you see it in, uh, in Celtic traditions with keening and women singing and wailing the banshees and the screaming. This is like a big, something to be said about doing this. It's powerful, but of course it makes people uncomfortable and people don't maybe not necessarily want to hear it, but it allows everyone to, it gives everyone permission to step in to the cathartic process, step into the grief. So when you have the women holding space, shrieking and wailing and crying, they're almost doing it on behalf of everyone else. And also it gives, allows everyone else to feel free to do it too. So it's like, there's this like almost like a domino effect that happens energetically. I think this is really important. Of course, in the West, we do not this sort of thing. You know, it's, it's something that's just not done. So that's the link that you see through. So the theme of catharsis, which we've lost touch with. And also something that I've noticed in many of these cultures that seem to hold these ancient traditions is that they have a respect for the elders of their communities. And this is something that we've lost in the West. Like you said, there's a, an obsession with youth and our elders are not respected. Uh, we've lost, there's a disconnect. Now, there's also a disconnection from nature too. And I think nature is a big part of this process as well. So a lot of these cultures that you still see carrying on these ancient practices and traditions of their funeral practices and death practices, they seem to be more in touch with nature. They're connected still more with nature than we are in the West. So they use nature as part of the process from the funeral pyres of India, uh, Veridasi, when you, the burning um, of, of of the bodies uh, to the sky burials of Tibet, you know, people returning back to nature, the vultures coming and feeding the, you know, the vultures and even connecting to the bones and just, that's just normal. This is nature. So a connection to the, the, the birth process, the life and the death process and the rebirth process, the cycle, the cycle of life which is part of nature. So a lot of these cultures still have that connection, that connection to nature. In the West, we are disconnected from nature, uh, tremendously so. Um, many of us don't even know, <laughs> we, you know, we don't know what to do. <laughs> like when we go out, even for a hike, <laughs> you know, sometimes we're like, what's that plant? We've lost touch of what certain plants are, what, what they do. We uh, na nature just seems like um, a novelty, uh, you know, we, we abuse it, we don't respect it, we're, we're trashing it. And so there's that as well. So I think catharsis, uh, respect for the elders, this, this, this kind of a community and a close knit community and connection to nature. So I think in the West, we've lost a disconnect from those three things. Uh, most of the West is just, you know, doped up on antidepressants, out of touch with their own emotional bodies, uh, certainly out of touch with nature, disconnected, um, disconnected from families and, and community. Um, it's interesting, right? Because we've become more technologically advanced than ever before, more connected online and through social media and more connected to any any time in history yet we're experiencing the most social isolation that we've ever experienced and high numbers of depression you know it just it doesn't add up you think how how does that work but i do look at those you know those things as being a, a big part of the problem as well as also just the structure of our society as being a big part of the problem. Um, you know, a lot of people being trapped into this capitalistic system where everybody's working like wage slaves and 
you know, in their offices, in their cubicles, and, and, and not, you know, not living lives that are conducive to having a happy spirit. So, um, yeah, I think we experienced the big disconnect uh, during the Industrial Revolution in the West, where everybody moved from the rural areas that they were working in, working the lands, working the farms, connected to nature, all of a sudden uprooted and pulled into the cities, working at factories, uh, huge uh, explosion of the workforce. So the industrial revolution, I think is when that disruption started. So that began with, you know, uh, people working more uh, in cities and less connected to the land and also a disconnection from community and family and you know as, as we've advanced forward it's just become more and more isolated and uh, but there's hope there's hope because I think uh, what we could do is just you know have these conversations <laughs> and work towards implementing these healthier ways of being, uh, especially when, when it comes to not just death, but also living too. Because, <laughs> you, you know, that's what we're doing at the moment. We're living. Uh, but hopefully that answered your question as to why that's different with those cultures compared to the West. Yeah, I, I was walking back. Uh, I, I practice uh, jujitsu, which is a martial art. And I, I was walking back and um, I've been running a workshop. So I I had to get back uh, relatively quickly and I, I was walking through this field and I passed these three guys and uh, they were sitting there drinking chicha, which is kind of like a local beer and uh, aguardiente, which is uh, <clears throat> kind of like a rum. And uh, they stopped me and they offered me a glass and I was like, oh, you know, I really got to go. But I was like, oh, I can't refuse this. So I, I drank a glass and we're talking and, you know, then there's a second glass and a third glass and the rum and um, but it, it was really beautiful because they, they were sitting there, you know, tilling the soil. They were kind of taking a break from a hard day's work and somehow COVID came up and, you know, they were saying like this, this corn that we're growing, like it gives us life, it gives us food, it gives us this chicha, it gives us this rum. We have these medicine plants that, that, that heal us, uh, you know, why, why do we need to go anywhere else? We have everything we need right here. We have the sun, it gives us life, it protects us, it gives us strength. We have this beautiful water coming out of the ground, it gives us life. And, you know, there was just this real simplicity and wisdom and that everything they needed was right there. And it was, it was really beautiful. You know, you were mentioning this idea of, you know, when people are sitting at a funeral, like there's like this, this holding of the upper lip, like, uh, you know, I can't cry, I, I need to be strong, that would show vulnerability. I often see that a bit with with some of this work too, like you mentioned these ideas of meditation. And some of those practices seem to be pointing to this idea of like, well, I just observe everything, you know, nothing impacts me, I'm, I'm just the witness of everything. And uh, you know, part of what you were mentioning with this idea of holding space is like tapping into that, I forget the word you use, but that space where it is just an observation and kind of knowing that everything is okay. And it reminded me of this story that, that there's a teacher who I like a lot, maybe you've heard of her, her name is Byron Katie. And um, I, I really like her work. And it, she was mentioning when her mother was dying and people were coming into the room and they were all crying and worried. And she was just sitting with her mother and she noticed that when her mother kind of listened to that or took that in, that things were bad, things, this shouldn't be happening, that she could see that in her mother. Then her mother became depressed and angry. And why is this happening to me? And then those people left and she was holding the space and for her, everything was okay. It was as it should be, it, there was a beauty to it. And then she would see the change in her mother and then her mother was joyous again and happy and they were sharing these beautiful moments. Um, and then she was, eventually her mother died and, and they had a wake and, uh, and 
she said something which was really interesting that, that I wasn't necessarily expecting. She said at some moment, she didn't know where it came from, but just this huge cathartic release came out and she just started wailing and she didn't know where it was coming from. She said like this thought arose, like, you know, why am I doing this? Or maybe I should stop. There's other people around. And then she said, well, well why, why would I do that? This is what's happening. And so she just let it out. And it was this huge cathartic release. So I find that really interesting that, that you were saying in a lot of these ancient practices, that's like a really important part of this dying experience is this cathartic release. And if we don't have that, potentially we never heal from that experience that it's just, again, kind of pushed aside and we go right back to our lives. We go back to our job. We, we go on as if like, obviously the thing happened, but we again, push it to the side. So do you have any sense of why that cathartic release is so important and, and actually what's happening there? Um, you know, it also makes mm -hmm. me think of a way like you, you, we often hear these like stories of like when a lion goes after a deer, you know, and if it gets away, then it kind of it, it stays there for a second and then it just shakes itself. And, you know, then it kind of goes back to normal, but it in a way too has this cathartic release. And um, so, yeah, maybe any ideas around that? Yeah, catharsis, it's so important. And that's a beautiful story about Katie that you were just describing with her, her mother and and her her process of catharsis, just the wailing just coming out. Um, I had my, my experience with the wailing, which came out. Uh, so my friend, Ren, who I was telling you about was like high school friend, childhood friend. So he he died really suddenly and very tragically five years ago. And I, he went missing, but I didn't know he had gone missing. His sister had sent out a mass email saying, Ren's, Ren's missing, we've got the police involved, they're trying to find him. But for some reason, my, my email address got left out in the mail shot. So I had no idea that Ren was missing. So, you know, I had talked to him a month prior we go, you know, maybe a few months without speaking. It was totally fine. That was normal. This one morning, I get this email from his sister, and I hadn't heard from his sister probably since high school. So I was like, what? Seeing, I saw her name in, in my inbox. I was like, that's strange. So I clicked on the email, and the first sentence was, Hey everyone, I've got some bad news. The, the police found Ren's body washed up on shore. Da, da, da. So I'm reading this, right? And I, I had no idea he was even missing. And as soon as I read the, those first few seconds, or the first few sentences, something took over within me where I started howling, wailing, and screaming. Like, just like, I just broke out into this, like, like this primal screaming and it was like I like I had no control of it there was like a whole part of my brain like who is that screaming right now it was I was so detached from what my body was doing it was like something deep in my soul just went just completely through into this cathartic wailing and screaming of course my partner's like in the other room and just here's you know, he's like, what is going on? He had, you know, shocked, came in and was like, Trey, 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 what's going on? What's going And I was like, literally, my body was just shaking. I was in this weird, like convulsions as well. Like, uh, like I was almost having like this energetic, like release. It was so bizarre. And I just allowed it. I, I didn't fight it at all. I just, went with it and it lasted for a long time let me tell you and then lay down and like process this whole thing and was speaking to my partner and I was so struck by this primal kind of reaction it really felt very healing as well and it got me really into this whole concept of catharsis so what's happening when we have a cathartic release, that one was triggered unexpectedly. And I didn't go, 
right, I think I'm going to have a cathartic release right now. So I'm going to just start screaming. <laughs> it was just like, ah, it just happened. And it was absolutely fascinating, to be honest, because it was like something in my soul just went, ah. And it, it was, you know, looking back, I felt like a gift. It was good. It was good that I went with it. So I think what happens when we have a cathartic release, we can have one that's spontaneous like that. And you see it famously in films as well. You know, someone gets a phone call and they hear the bad news and they're like, Rah! you know, they have the, the release. And then others, uh, you can like induce, you know, you induce it. Um, and also, you know, in a lot of these cultures around the world, there'll be women who are specifically there to kind of help facilitate it. By, by the wailing and the shrieking or the song or the chanting. So I think what happens, there's an energetic shift. I really do think that. I think there's something within us that shifts energetically when we have a, a cathartic release. I mean, I experienced it physically. I was literally like, like convulsing, shaking, like, like energy was surging. And I look back at it and see it as an, in a way, it was a bit of a, like a, an awakening in a way, like it was like a energetic shift, um, almost like a, some people describe Kundalini. You know, it felt like I got really activated. In fact, I know I did because after the death of my friend, lots of things started opening up for me, you know, in many ways. So it felt as though it was part of that, but it felt like also an emotional processing, which is really important and healthy that we release emotions, that we process emotions in, in truthful and open ways uh, through the process of grieving. So it had that, um, that effect as well, holistically. And I think it also helps, it shifts something, it shifts something in the space, it, sh it shifts into the transition it's a release, it's a letting go, it's part of the dying process in its own right. So when we are releasing cathartically, we're also letting something of ourselves die. And that's not a bad thing. It's, I'm saying that in a good, in a good way. So we're almost stepping into this resolve uh, through the process of doing that. In fact, many people I talked to who've had a death of a loved, of a loved one said that they felt an awakening afterwards that they felt a shift within their being. It changed them forever. Uh, it, it made them more connected to themselves, connected to the universe, connected to life. So I think, again, we have a choice. We can, we can step into it and, and anesthetize ourselves and just hit the bottle or get onto the antidepressants and, and you know, stiff up our lip and repress everything, but it's still there. And it will come up in different ways <laughs> through the years. So it could come up through another trauma, which it reactivates everything again. It could come up in therapy. It could come up in plant medicine ceremony. Uh, it will come up. So it's either you, 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 you go with it and roll with it then, or you roll with it at a later time. <laughs> so I'm all up for doing it now. Um, so in fact, a big part of my death doula work to um, not just helping those who are transitioning is I help those left behind because I really do see that death is not just an individual problem for the person who's actually dying. It's also a collective, it's a collective experience too. So it's, it's social, it affects those who are left behind. And in fact, it's harder probably for them than the, than the people who, who died. So I also hold space for those who, uh, who have, are going through grief and they haven't had closure. I've been really busy this year actually because of COVID. A lot of people experiencing the death of a loved one and not being able to be by their bedside because they're dying of COVID in the hospital. So because of restrictions, they could not say goodbye. And a lot of people feeling the lack of closure and the lack of catharsis. So I've been doing these sessions with, with folks, um, of course, all on Zoom at the moment, um, where I guide them through an hour of cathartic release. 
and closure. So it's a combination of meditation and, and moving through their energetic body through each chakra and allowing release in each chakra and also breathing into it and breathing into big deep sighs and inducing inducing crying and wailing and wailing and crying with them and allowing the process to come out and i also through the session to uh, bring them into a deep state of meditation where they connect with their loved one and have a conversation the conversation that they wanted to have and then um, allow themselves to write that conversation in a letter to themselves or in a letter. Uh, and then part of the process moving forward is burning the letter and collecting the ashes. And then they have the ashes for the letter. And then they're able to go scatter the ashes and do whatever they'd like with the ashes as part of like a, also part of a cathartic process, like to, to honor the person who they've lost. And that's, so that's something I've been doing cathartic processes for those who've, you know, who are going through bereavement. And I've had to basically get creative, you know, <laughs> thinking like, what have I done for myself? And what have I experienced for myself? And what has been used in ancient practices? And how can we pull this all together that can work in a Zoom session? <laughs> and uh, just sort of fashioned it all together. And even just through Zoom, it's, it's had its, you know, people have been able to shift a bit out of it. And I can't wait until, you know, back in real life because it'd be great to hold space in real life with some retreats and workshops, you know, for people who've had loss so people could come and heal and move through the grief, but uh, I think it's important and it's something we've lost touch with in the West and hopefully we can come back to healing each other <laughs> through this process. <laughs> you mentioned this idea of, of uh, the legality of uh, death and I, I became aware of that as, you know, people in my life uh, passed away and that there are all of these rules and regulations around it and I would imagine like many things, these laws came from seemingly a good place of like how to dispose the body, not having it in the house too long. So there's no sickness or illness and where can you bury it where you can. not But it seems like, you know, in a way that really disconnects us again. I mean, I, I know in certain places, like you're not allowed to bury your dead one in your backyard if you wanted to. I mean, like almost this like fundamental human right of like, why would the state be able to have power to tell me where I can place my my loved one, my family member? So do you have do you have any sense of what those laws are so that maybe people are more familiar with them so they, they know what their choices are? I mean, I, I imagine it would obviously depend on country and even in regions in the country. And and it, do you have any sense of, is there a movement or are there ways that, that those laws may begin to be changed to be more acceptable and adaptable? You know, because in this time we, you know, we, we talk about diversity and all of these things, and yet it seems like around death, there isn't a whole lot of diversity. Like you have to do what you have to do. Like there's no, you don't have a lot of choice and it's not really respecting different people's desires and their wants and their customs and their religions. So... Yes, and it's good to know what is available and what is out there. Uh, the funeral industry is like a multi, multi-million dollar industry. So there is interest here. <laughs> so people, you know, that industry doesn't want people to know how to do it themselves, obviously. Um, the funeral director stepped into the picture most predominantly around the time after the Civil War, there was uh, huge amounts of people who died. In fact, whole families would be wiped out during the Civil War. So back then, of course, people, when they were, when they had died, they would be cared for at home and everyone would view the body at home and have their own wakes. But at that time there was, the body count was high. So there would be like, you know, seven family members 
on in one home dead so you wouldn't have a place to be able to store everybody so this is when the funeral director popped up uh, in history and so did the technique of embalming as well so this is when the preserving of the body stepped into play uh, because it gave time for people to be able to to see their loved ones and preserve, preserve, you know, because there was so many deaths. But it never really went away. It went from strength to strength. Uh, and embalming is still big, big business to this day. Uh, it's terribly pollutant, um, horrendous for the environment, uh, not to mention, you know, all that blood, raw blood going into our, um, our sewage system because you have to drain the blood out of the body and then replace it with the chemicals, formaldehyde. And then not to mention the formaldehyde leaking into the earth, you know, into the soil, into the network uh, around uh, the body. So that being sucked up into the air, you know, through the process of, of our earthly processes and then rain back down. So, you know, it's literally raining these sort of chemicals. And not to mention also even cremation is terribly pollutant as well. Uh, all of that, uh, you know, pollutant going up into the atmosphere too. So, you know, these are the two big um, multi-million dollar industries. So, of course, they've got the stronghold on how to dispose of the body and how to take care of the body. Um, interestingly enough, a lot of people go into funeral debt this is not much talked about much, but a lot of people go in debt because of funerals, because you're so grieved and you don't know what to do. You just, you know, you give over everything to the funeral director to sort out. And then you come by at the end of it with like thousands of dollars worth of, of prices and costs you know, for the funeral, for the embalming, for the flower, you know, you name it, it adds up. And a lot of people fall into funeral debt. And now the cheaper option is cremation. And still even that is thousands of pounds or thousands of dollars. And which can even someone who doesn't have much of a budget can fall into debt, just even getting their loved one cremated. So I think one thing to know is that there's other options that you don't need to go and hand it over to, you know, these, these middlemen. Because um, often too, the middlemen, their choices of, doesn't feel like it's connected to what the person was like. So they put you in this coffin, you're like, oh, Jack would never have chosen a coffin like that. And why are we in a church right now? He wasn't even Christian. You know, like you know, all these things end up happening uh, that just feels not like it's like the person, you know? And all of a sudden it's this weird thing that just doesn't fit right it's a suit that doesn't fit right so as a death doula we also give these options and like let people know like hey you know you don't need to have a funeral director you don't need to be embalmed or have all these other things um look into the laws of your of, of your state or your territory your region but pretty much most will allow you time before you call anyone to come and, and, and take the body. Of course, there are different criteria because if a person dies obviously under mysterious situation, <laughs> unknown situation, of course, you're gonna need to call the authorities because there could be, you know, you, you'll need an autopsy, there'll need to be a report. And there's, you know, there's a process to, to go through in order to determine why the person died. But if you're an ill person and you, you know that you're dying and you're, you want to die at home, you can certainly, uh, after the person's died, um, sp spend some time with them, you know, spend some time with them. You don't need to call straight away and have the body um, taken away. So it's important to, um, to know what your law is uh, within your state or your area. And find out that beforehand and you'll be surprised that it's like, oh, I'm actually allowed to do that. Some places could allow you to bury on your own land. Again, you would need to um, 
look into the laws. Sometimes it just requires filling out a um, filling out some paperwork to to get. Um, I think I can't remember it is, but I think if it's more than a few more than three bodies, then it's considered a cemetery or something. Uh, with some places, it's like there's a law where if it's, it's more than a, an amount of bodies, then it's going to ha have to be registered as a cemetery. So look into that because it's different from state to state or region to region. There's also places that have green burial spaces now. So if you want an eco-friendly way of, of being buried, there's designated places that you can um, bury your loved one completely uh, chemical free uh, and completely in a biodegradable um, uh, box or uh, shelter. Um, and obviously you can do things like plant a tree there where they were instead of having a tombstone. So you can just bring them back to the earth, bring them back to uh, the cycle. Uh, there's even these amazing things called infinity suits which are uh, these special suits that have like, um, like these interesting uh, matrix design on them, uh, a network that's injected with um, spores of mushrooms. It's uh, like, so you become part of the mycelium network. So when you get buried, you just biodegrade and, and join the mycelium network and part of the become part of the mushroom, the mushroom kingdom. <laughs> and there's loads of different ways in which you can, um, you know, ec ecologically uh, in a in a safe way, be <laughs> go back to the elements. There's even human compost uh, project going on right now, where you just become a, a part of the compost and come go back to the earth. So there's lots of different ways in which you can do it. But of course, yeah, look into, it's doable. It's called DIY, DIY funerals and DIY death practices. There's eco and green and uh, planet friendly ways in which to do it. It's just that we're not given the information. So uh, we're, we're sort of shoehorned into, you know, this middleman of the funeral director. Um, and often, and it just, you know, I think these things are changing, you know, and I think it will be very, very different, you know, 30 years time, the way we navigate uh, death and dying and also just what we do with our bodies afterwards. And I think it's going to be more positive ways in the future. And I also think COVID in the pandemic is just actually, actually quite good because it's bringing to light all of these topics because it's so in our face right now you know death is so on the menu right now and we're looking at new ways in which we can navigate uh, we're going to probably see a lot of people post pandemic uh, really having post-traumatic pandemic disorder you know what i mean and they're going to be asking these big questions so i think this is a really great time for us to step into a new way of being and uh, a new structure moving forward that's that's healthy for us as a community individually and also as a planet too so like all together these things are moving forward in innovative almost like a mix of futuristic ways and also the archaic like combining these two things together in order to create like a more healthy way of being and especially around death and dying so hopefully, fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, along that same line of questioning, I, I mean, I, I think a topic that's becoming more talked about is this idea of, I think there's a term for it, I don't know, like the, the right to die. And in, in, many, in many societies that we live in, that's illegal. Like you're not allowed to take your life. I mean, even suicide is, is, is a crime in a way. And um, or, or assisted death, when someone says, like, I've had enough, and I, I, I want to go, that's a crime. And again, I would imagine some of these things, you know, started with good reason, like, well, if someone is suicidal, we don't want to give them that option, we're, we're saying, hey, maybe they're mentally unwell, we want to care for them, or 
you know, obviously that can be a slippery slope too. If, if, you know, if someone isn't in the right state of mind and their family says, oh, well, we want them to die and maybe there's money or inheritance involved. So I can understand maybe where some of those things came from, but it seems like a person in sound mind should have the fundamental human right to decide if they've had enough. Um, do you do you see that that's part of a movement where that is a growing movement or there is changes in legality around that and and what that entails and how that looks like and you know even that question like I would imagine until someone is in that situation we can never really know what we would choose but it seems like if if a person does again in in a sound frame of mind want to do that what is i mean do you think that that's a, a viable thing and and then what are options to 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 be able to do that yeah so it's certainly something that's um happening even now there are countries where it's completely legal uh the, the assisted right to die is is there. And in fact, Switzerland's one country that you can uh, go and choose to die and have an injection and, and say goodbye. But there's a lot of controversy, obviously, around this, around this whole process. Controversy mostly because it's an existential one, but it's also one that holds a lot of weight when it comes to abuse of power and abuse of this right to die. And if it gets, this kind of law gets passed and it's in the wrong hands of the wrong sort of government or the wrong kind of powers that be, that it could be um, very, very worrying uh, in many, many ways. So it's one of those really, ah, Difficult, difficult, difficult ones to, to approach. I do think that I like to look at the base note of the entire concept of, of people who even want to die. And why do they want to die? Most people want to die because of uh, a failing um, quality of life. Quality of life is not being met and it's creating misery. And it could be a physical quality of life that's creating misery through an illness. Uh, and it also could be, you know, de depressive as well, like a, a mental, spiritual, emotional quality of life that is feeling that it's miserable and it's not being met as well. So what I like to do is go whittle down, distill it all down to the foundation is why, why are people feeling like their quality of life isn't being met? How can we change that instead of giving them the exit pill? What can we do to make it better so people don't feel like they, you know, that that's an option? Let's, let's, let's change the structure from the baseline upwards so that that people don't even want to do that. Now, there's very unique situations where people are tremendously ill and they are pancreatic cancer or a really fast moving cancer and they don't want to go through the painful process. So that's slightly different because it has nothing to do really with the, the a systemic problem about you know, culture or structure. Uh, creating a misery within a person. This is to do with their physical body tremendously failing them. So perhaps, you know, in certain, certain circumstances, maybe that would make sense. And sure, obviously those who do go to Switzerland and, and have the process, it's because they're very, very ill and they're on their way out anyway. So it's just speeding up that process uh, for a humane way. Um, but when it comes to depression and other things, emotional, uh, physical, uh, emotional and spiritual, I do think that we, we, we're failing. We're failing as a society. If people are trying to exit because of those things, 
then we, we should really <laughs> fix our society. We should heal our sick society because that's why everyone else is sick. That's why we have people who are depressed and suicidal. It's, it's a system that we live in. So um, changing that uh, should be the first thing we do rather than giving people these pills or, to this, or needles for the escape on the way out. But if you look back at um, humane assisted deaths, it goes back for a long time in history too, where you have it happening in various cultures as well, where um, a famous one is like the Inuit culture, where the, a, a tremendously old person within their community is um, clearly old and dying and their body's failing and it's getting close to, to them being dead and and uh, they um, get onto a little iceberg onto a piece of ice and they cut the ice away and they push it out and send out the elder into the elements uh, to die so that's you know that's an example uh, of that happening in a compassionate and humane way and it's honored it's not like they're being cold or callous there's um, a ritualistic and, you know, humane honoring there of the elder, but that's part of that tradition. So, you know, you see it through various traditions. So you wonder, well, there's these humane practices, but it's done almost like, it seems like it's in a safe space. It's in a community space. So yeah, it's a tricky, it's a tricky question, right? Because we, you know, we should have the right to do this. I mean, um, if, we, if we so wish, but then at the same time, we wanna protect people too from making a decision where um, their needs could have been supported, but maybe we're failing. So it shouldn't be a quick fix remedy to have someone exit, you know, when we can have it, when we could sort it out. So yeah, it's one of those open-ended questions, you know, where in some cases you go, yes, I can see why, yes. And other situations like, yeah, but it, there's, it's a gray area. There could be a lot of abuse when it comes to that mm -hmm. as well. But it's a really valid question. And moving forward into the future, this might be something that changes too. You might be able to see that this is an option more and more for people who are terminally ill and um, want to have a peaceful passing. So, I mean, I could really see it being a future, a future thing, you know, where there's places that people go and can have a peaceful passing and it's an injection and music's playing and their loved ones are there, they could say goodbye. And I can see it, I can clearly see it. Um, one thing that I feel can really help support people who are afraid of the process of dying or who are struggling with death and they just want it to be peaceful and they don't want to struggle with it is the use of plants at end of life as well, particularly anthogens and the psychedelics. It being very therapeutic and very helpful for people navigating the dying process. Because when you go through a plant journey and you are communing with an entheogen, it brings you into those liminal states. You have the boundary dissolving uh, experience of ego death and you're able to access this zone or realm outside of your ego construct, which is like the death experience because I've seen it in slow time with people who are dying, uh, the ego disillusion. And anthogens and plants, they can help you get there. They can prepare you for death. And so I'm, of course, this is not legal too, because we're talking about legalities. <laughs> Assisted uh, dying is not legal, only in a few countries, but also psychedelics are not legal. They are slowly becoming legal in various states, but I'm a big advocate for using uh, anthogens at end of life uh, in a guided, safe, and therapeutic and integrative way, um, holding space for people through that. Um, I'm currently studying with the Aleph Trust with, in, a, in a program for psychedelics, altered states, and transpersonal psychology. 
So a big part of that is, you know, being able to, you know, step into this psychedelic renaissance and be able to, when laws unfold a little bit more, to hold space for people uh, as a guide and in integrative ways, as a death doula, to work alongside our plant allies too, to help people heal and prepare for the dying process. And it's, they've had, it's ama there's amazing results. I mean, there's, there's a lot of data on this now of how, you know, psilocybin, ayahuasca, these plants have been able to tremendously help people when it comes to alleviating depression around dying, uh, releasing fear of death. It's phenomenal. So uh, yeah, another illegal gray area, but I think we'll get there. I do think so. I think uh, the future is like I said, it's futuristic, but then we're going to be bringing in all this ancient ways of connection with nature. I mean, I see the vision of the future as this beautiful marriage between amazing, you know, innovation, futuristic scientific technological innovation mixed with the plant kingdom and the ancient, you know, archaic connection to the logos together. And this really beautiful symbiosis um, and also the collapse of capitalism. <laughs> it's interesting because uh, something I always found fascinating was was kind of the psychology around it. And, um, you know, even I think if people are, are against maybe assisted death, if anyone has ever had an animal, you know, very rarely, especially an animal in captivity, because an animal in a wild, almost always it dies a, what we would say a pretty violent death. At some point it just can't take care of itself and it gets eaten by another animal. But animals in captivity like pets, it usually gets to a point where they end up suffering a lot. And, and I think any owner of a, of a pet, eventually, even if they don't like that idea, they realize like, hey, this animal is really suffering and the humane thing to do is to put it down. And yet with humans, we have a completely different view of that. It's seen as like, again, a taboo thing to do. And, um, you know, I've spent a long time in the Amazon and, and I've heard these stories of when when a when an older person got to a certain age where they felt like they couldn't contribute or they were becoming a burden on their family or their tribe, they just wandered off into the woods and let nature mm -hmm. do its thing. I, I remember when I was a kid, I, I was very interested in North Native American traditions. And there was those same stories of just wandering yeah. off into the woods and, and going back, you know, literally and figuratively into nature. And I mean, even where I grew up, like near the Appalachian, it was same thing. Like sometimes like when a man got too old, he just took his shotgun and went off into the woods. And, you know, there, but there was like an honor in that in a way. Uh, I mean, even I'm really interested in martial arts and, and a lot of those originated in Japan. And, you know, there's also this idea of like, if one lost their honor, like one took their own life, it was considered a very honorable thing rather than a sign of defeat. It was, it was, you know, rather than being killed, you, you did it yourself rather than putting that responsibility on someone else, you took that power back. So yeah, it's a very interesting thing. You, you were talking about this idea, which we mentioned a little bit at the, the beginning, is that, you know, for me, again, these these two ideas of dreaming and death with this, this shamanic world working with plants, and death is such a common motif. You know, even ayahuasca, like you mentioned, that, that word is a Quechua word that means vine of the dead. And so much I think of this plant work is in a way this preparation of death, you know, so that hopefully, like, as they would say in, in Tibetan traditions to, to die before we die so that we can fully live so that we can fully enjoy life. And the shedding away of, of all of these things that are no longer serving us the, the traumas, the beliefs, the, the anger, the worry, the, the blaming, the the, the ideas, the, the masks that we put on of I am this, I am that, this is me, this is I, me, mine, and the shedding away of that. And, and that's why often these, this plant work can be so harrowing and frightening is because we all say, well, I wanna be free, 
but as those layers begin to fall away, it's terrifying because then it's like, well, who am I? We're going into the unknown. We're going into that death experience. And again, it seemed like in so many cultures, I mean, even, you know, the, the cultures you were mentioning, like the Druids or the ancient mystery schools of Greece and, and Egypt, again, it seemed like all of these esoteric traditions were somehow preparation for death. So you mentioned it a little bit, this plant work, and you know, even uh, in the states, like Johns Hopkins, they've they've done a lot of research now with psilocybin and and assisting people who have terminal illness, and uh, you know, a lot of people they seemingly, you know, they they self purport that 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 fear that they had around the dying experience was either greatly alleviated or even made peace with, like they've accepted. And they 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 approach that death and dying experience now with a sense of peace. So, do you have an idea, uh, you know, with your work with that death and dying experience, and then also your work with with psychedelics with plant medicine, like why that's so beneficial? What it's doing with people that's really allowing them to to either go into that dying state or to become to to potentially have peace with that. Yes. Yeah, so this goes back to consciousness. So back to that, the whole concept of consciousness and the psychedelic experience can bring about mystical states of consciousness. And what I mean by mystical is something that's transformative and feels greater than what you are. So it's a connecting to something boundary dissolving and beyond your, your story. And when we get to those sort of places, and we don't necessarily have to get to them through psychedelics or plant work. You can get to them through breath work. You can get to them through lucid dreaming. You can get there through meditation. And also I mentioned like the death of a family member, the birth of a child. These big things can also uh, activate it. So I think what's happening is when we go into these zones outside of our ego construct, we, we realize that we are just pure consciousness and that is having an experience. And the experience is called this tree or you, Jason. And, and then when you kind of get into that zone, you realize that, wow, so after my body dies, then maybe I just go back into that connected state again. So what is happening when we, when we have a psychedelic experience? So what happens is our brain, our, we, we start functioning in a totally different way. Um, the default um, network uh, just shuts down and we're able to start perceive things outside of our seemingly normal neurological connections and also our brain waves change so mostly we're in the brain wave of beta which i call the ego brain wave <laughs> because beta is our problem solving tax task orientated overthinking brain wave so we're predominantly in beta most of the time and when we're dreaming and we're in meditations, when we're in trance-like states, we're in a, psycho a psychedelic state, we are shifted into a slower brainwave, which is the theta brainwave. And that's when we seem to access this style of consciousness that has this, you know, mystical quality. Um, so for me, I, sometimes, I, you know, we try to artic articulate it in words, like, I had a mystical experience. I, I had an ego disillusion. I felt like I connected to the, the divine or to universal oneness. Uh, or we say, you know, I had a spiritual experience. And then we all, we know all those words and what that kind of flavor is. And then we can look at the word, um, they're, they're very egotistical. They are, they're acting out of their ego. They're, they're rigid. They're not able to, think outside of the box they're a material reductionist and so we can look at that as well as just these two you know another word to define uh, a state of being to define an experience 
But I like to look at both words. So we'll just use the word spiritual and we'll look, we'll look at the word egotistical. And I see them kind of like uh, in biological terms. And I whittle it down and distill it down to well, what is it really? It's a, it's a state of consciousness. And what is it connected to in our brain? Oh, it's connected to our brain waves, which uh, our brain waves show a state of consciousness. So when we're in beta, we're really in the ego. <laughs> so uh, beta brain wave, which is the ego mind and the overthinking mind, the chattering monkey mind. And then we have the spiritual, which people define as the mystical or spiritual experience. That seems to come about when we're in theta, the theta brainwaves. So I, I look at these things as I, I try to strip them away from their the tropes because people hear those words in different ways and they can get really like tiring hearing those words and become something completely different. So I just whittle it down to the brainwaves. So either being in a beta brainwave or a theta brainwave, when we fluctuate between both. And when we're in these seemingly mystical experiences or spiritual experiences, we are experiencing this slower brainwave of theta. So it's interesting. So everyone's trying to get to the theta, you know, but they may not even know it. Um, so people are doing meditation. They're like really into breath work, yoga, uh, into fasting, into plant medicine, uh, all of these different things, tools, techniques to pull you into this state of consciousness, which is like the slower brainwave. Now, interestingly enough, as little children, when we're children, very small children, specifically before the age of six and seven, before we start going into like the school system, we are predominantly in the theta brainwave. And this is a scientific fact. And uh, that's how kids roll. They are walking around in a dreamlike state all the time. And that's why kid, people love kids so much because they go, kids say the darndest things. They say these little things of wisdom. They talk to, uh, you know, imaginary characters. They talk to plants. They're really in their own world. It's like, well, they kind of are. <laughs> They're in another world. They are in a theta brainwave, which is literally walking around like in a dreamlike state constantly. And the interesting thing, though, is walking around in a dreamlike state. It's also like being in the state of hypnosis, too, because hypnosis is also a theta brainwave. And that's why as little kids, we that's where we absorb everything. That's where we absorb all of our stories, the negative ones and the trauma, everything gets absorbed in those first seven years of life. And they're there on the really deep, deep, deep unconscious level. And then we shift into school and then we, you know, get into the system and we start operating on beta brainwave predominantly learning, problem solving, and our egos start to form and solidify. And we spend most of our life in the construct of, of, of that uh, modality. And all through our life, we're trying to get back to the theta brainwave so that we can heal, <laughs> so we can unpack all that stuff in the unconscious that we absorbed in our state of hypnosis uh, for the first seven years of our lives. But it's like, that's what we're trying to get back to. It's like, we're trying to get back to this brainwave. Um, if you're to whittle it down to just biological terms. And that brainwave holds a lot of stuff. That's where people get their moments of insight. That's where people do the deep healing. There's a thing called theta healing. Uh, that's where you get it when people go for hypnosis. Also, amazing feats of insight come through these flow states. It's called the flow state, where some people who are clairvoyant receive information. Those who are mediums are able to hear names and messages from the other side. And it's like going back into that childlike state. And, you know, you hear people say, connect to the inner child, go back to being a child. It's like, you're literally going back to the brainwave. And interestingly enough, when we are on the other set, side of life and we're going through the dying process and we are actively dying, and there's those three days of active dying when we are shutting down, our brainwaves change and they start to slow and they go into theta. And they are slowing, slowing, slowing all the way down, the brainwave slowing all the way down, all the way to the moment of death, all the way down to delta, the slowest brainwave possible. And 
that's how we exit. So there's something to be said about brain waves and and you know breaking it down to theta mode and beta mode and how to surf them. So getting back to your question about psychedelics and entheogens, when we commune with plants, they help us slow down. They help us go back to that brainwave, which is a very receptive brainwave. It's one where we can receive insight. We can, our consciousness can perceive things from different vantage points because we're not stuck in the over chattering you know, egoic, egoic mind of, of the beta brainwave. So I see it in very just distilled terms when it comes to that. Um, and effectively, that's why these plants are so amazing. They're guides and helpers that help us get back to that. Um, now, there, it's not the only way we can get there, because I would mention there's so many other practices that people can get there. But I think it's really helpful for those who our end of life uh, that are struggling and it can it could bring into this amazing healing perspective and it is a perspective you come out of a journey or you know with with a plant with a different perspective your consciousness experiences something from a different vantage point you realize all the things that you were so concerned about in life are so trivial and you're like why was i so hung up on status and hung up on this and that and why didn't i love that person more or tell them i love them more why didn't i forgive that person why am i holding bitterness or grudges and now you're either going to get there through a psychedelic experience or another experience or you'll get there through the process of dying because people i've, I've helped um, through the dying process this will happen anyway you know as you move close to death it's going to happen anyway. You're going to, your vantage point will change. Your perspective will change. And you'll realize that you might've squandered your life away by being really bitter and holding on to things that you just go, Oh my God, that was not even important. And then you feel like regrets. And it's one thing people get a lot at end of life is regrets. So part of all these practices and process of getting back to that theta brain wave is that you end up just living better you 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 connect to the magic of life this amazing thing that we're experiencing right now is probably the most incredible thing ever just life and just being in the present moment being conscious and aware observant and just feeling it and being one with it so the theta brainwave allows you to connect with it cool thing is too if you go into nature and there's studies that show you just go into nature you just sit there your brain waves naturally slow down. And there's a big thing called forest bathing that, that's kind of like on trend at the moment where uh, there's been some tests done and your brain waves actually slow down just being in nature. So it's almost like our natural default setting is to be around the plants and to be with them and to just be around them and so they're even externally helping us slow down and slow down into that theta wave uh so anyway that's uh <laughs> that's what i think about that it's interesting there, there there's a you're probably familiar with it uh, imperial college of london and i i work with some people who who are associated there and uh recently they published a couple of studies and i, I found it very fascinating because it was they were, they were mapping the brain. I think it was when people were taking ayahuasca. It could have been psilocybin. I can't remember. But what they seemed to show is that the brain was lit up, like all of the, the areas that were dormant, like that the brain was functioning on, on all cylinders. And yet, interestingly, I think a lot of people would have thought that meant that the activity was increased. And yet what they found is exactly what you were saying. It was decreased. It was slowing down. And they said it, it mimicked the, the closest thing they could relate it to was the brain of a child. And <clears throat> it's very interesting because that also, to me, correlates to that idea of death is, you know, as we, as we become older, we, we put on these different masks, these beliefs, these thoughts, and it becomes kind of more and more barriers, more and more solidified in our ego structure and further and further away from our essence or our true nature. And that essentially the psychedelics 
by slowing the brain down, we would think that would mean almost like a dumbing down, but it's the opposite. As we get slower and slower and slower, the brain becomes more and more alive. And so by taking these plants and slowing the brain down, in a sense, we have access to everything. And, and that's exactly what traditional shamans are saying. You know, they're saying that state, whether it's the dream state or the psychedelic state, is even more real than our reality because everything is opened. There's infinite possibility. We're accessing all of the things that we don't normally have access to. And that sounds really weird to people. But again, as you said, like there's really easy ways of looking at that, right? Like light, the spectrum of light, like we see a small fraction of it. And yet we know now through, through various scientific modalities that there's whole ranges that we don't even experience. And yet they're real, they're there. It reminded me of a story of, I think it was actually in England, a, a doctor, uh, he, he noticed that uh, a lot of babies were, were dying and it seemed to him like that shouldn't be happening. And he, he came up with this idea that doctors should wash their hands before they help to deliver the baby. And he was ridiculed and laughed at. And they're saying, what, there's these invisible things in your hands that, that are, you know, causing problems with the baby, these, these bacteria and parasites, like these spirits that you can't even see. I mean, and they laughed at him and ridiculed him so much that eventually, I think he committed suicide. A decade later, through the invention of the microscope, they saw that what he was saying was real. There was all of these things that could not be seen with the human eye, and yet they were real. And when they did this simple thing of wash their hands before delivering the baby, the baby was fine, you know? And so even these ideas that we have of like spirits that we can't see, to so many people that sounds woo-woo or like, how can that be true? And yet, it just from that story, like that was true. There's these things that people yeah. couldn't see and yet they were real. Um, so I, I guess that kind of leads to the next part, which is this idea of dreaming. Uh, because dreaming is also something that people really seem to take for granted. I mean, we even have these expressions in, in the English language, like you tell a child or, you know, even an adult, like, oh, you're just dreaming as if that's, not important or you know someone has a, an idea or a, a mission in life and they're like oh well that's just a dream as if it's not real as if it's not important and again one of the the fundamental aspects of this this shamanic work is this idea of going into the dream state that essentially you know i think really good corderos are saying what we're doing by by ingesting these plants is we're we're entering the dream state. And yet, as you said, it's, we're going into the dream state and yet we're kind of conscious of it. It's like we have one foot in both worlds and we're able to interact and to, to play in that world, to take knowledge from that world, to, to take these insights and actually to be able to integrate them into our lives. Whereas often for people dreaming, maybe they remember their dream or it's very common where people say, oh, well, I don't dream rather than I just don't remember my dream. I, I haven't been able to take anything back from it. So what for you is the dream state? What do you think is happening and, and, and why is that so important? And, and something we seemingly kind of dismiss because as you were saying, these states of consciousness, it's a very particular state of consciousness and it's a state that most of us, we spend like a third of our lives in and yet we don't think about it at all. It's just, it's something we do every night. We lay in the bed, we pass out for all intents and purposes, we're dead. <laughs> and then we wake up the next day and we go about our lives and it's just, Oh, okay. That that's that. And it's, it's <clears throat> not something most people even really think about. It's so true. And dreams for the most part are shrugged off. Like you said, people just think, Oh, it was just a dream. It, it's, it's just junk data and it's just residual effects of something that you saw the day before they are nonsense they're silly they don't mean anything but dreams are experiences of consciousness and they are experiences of consciousness in an altered state 
the altered state is the dream state. So you are altered because your body is bio biologically going through a sleeping somnolent process, but still you are a, a, a consciousness still having experiences. So I see dreams very much in the same realm as a psychedelic experience. I see dreams as little psychedelic experiences every night uh, that are there to uh, show you something. So a psychedelic experience, like we were explaining and talking about before, it helps you to see something from a different vantage point. And often a psychedelic experience can give you a, an experience of vantage point that seems to be in an, a realm that is beyond the ego constructs. So it seems as though you're connected to a, a universal oneness, um, something that's just a point of awareness. But also the psychedelic experience can bring you into the, the realms of the unconscious. So all the stuff that's in there that has been suppressed, the emotional trauma, the wounds, uh, what they, you know, Jung called the, uh, the shadow, that coming up for review. So dreams are the same, the same territory. They might not seem as vivid or colorful, but certainly if you've ever had a lucid dream, it's, it can get into those territories. It can feel like a DMT experience with the vividness and the clarity and the hyper -real, realism that you can experience. But effectively dreams have the same language uh, the same language as the psychedelic experience, the plant experience. They have the same symbology as well, sometimes like absolutely absurd or surreal, you know, but then it's seeped in, in meaning. Uh, and it's got, it's a bit of a trickster too, because sometimes it really gets you. It can, it can shock you, it can scare you, you can wake up with a nightmare. But I see it very similar as, um, you know, working with plant medicine and you have like what you call like a very harrowing journey <laughs> where it feels like that was really hard. It was tough. Some people could call it a bad trip. Uh, nightmares are the same territory, so they can be your biggest teachers. So just like a, an experience with an enthogen where it was tough going, but there was great transformation and you had some amazing integration and healing after you can have the same with dreams. So dreams can have even the nightmares and the sleep paralysis. You can have an integrative process afterwards to, to allow uh, some kind of transpersonal experience and lesson from, from the process. So dreams are a lot more than you think. I really believe this. They are experiences of consciousness and they're valid. So, you know, some people just wake up and go, oh, it was just a dream. But you could probably contest that, you know, at least once in your life, you had a dream that felt so profound that it changed you. And it could be a dream that was a nightmare. It could have been a blissful dream. It could have been a mysterious recurring dream. Either way, they were experiences that you woke up from that felt changed by. So that in itself is valid because it, the experience changed you in some kind of way, it made you see something, some, something different. It could have uh, changed or shifted an emotion within you. That is valid. So it doesn't matter that your experience was in an altered state of dream and your consciousness experienced it in a dream state or if it happened in, in waking reality. The key is that it's a valid experience of consciousness. And you can work alongside your dreams to obviously go deeper with this. Um, so I don't see dreams as something to be shrugged off. Dreams are were considered a lot more important, you know, in ancient times. Uh, they were, uh, you know, there were seers and dreamers that were consulted by leaders and kings, you know, who please interpret my dream, and we need to listen to the dreams to make decisions. And, uh, you know, you've heard of the whole old saying of let's sleep on it, you know, th these sort of <laughs> leftover expressions are from a time when people really took their dreams seriously. Uh, people in communities went to their shamans to, to also uh, unpack their dreams and, and understand their meanings. People went to witches in Europe, you know, th this, this is not just cultural, this is 
a human thing. So you see this through all types of cultures and belief systems all over history and throughout the world. People took their dreams seriously, but then we had a disconnect. And how did that happen? Very much like we had the disconnect from nature, disconnect from our community, disconnect from the cathartic process of being a human being, disconnect from our elders. Something happened in history where we started just going, ah, oh, dreams, they're not important. And this probably happened more around the time of the 19th century when, you know, there was a lot of um, moving away from, uh, you know, shamanic traditions or traditions of the esoteric or witchcraft or, um, or what uh, I guess European white people would call the savages, you know, like this kind of stigma that, you know, people who talk about their dreams or listen to their dreams are somehow arcane, uh, superstitious, um, silly people, you know? So there became this um, way of looking at dreams as, as, as something that wasn't uh, deemed important. And then psychology helped mold this a little bit more moving forward where dreams started to be unpacked from more psychological point of views. Um, predominantly Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung as being like, you know, the, the forerunners with their dream analysis. Uh, yet some of their uh, techniques and uh, ways of being, although very, very clever, seem to not really hit the mark so much. I mean, I, I'm, I'm more on the Jungian camp than I would be the Freudian one, <laughs> mostly because Jung did have one foot in the mystical and, um, and, and did have uh, some, you know, beliefs of uh, the collective unconscious and uh, shamanism and some esoteric uh, uh, components there too. Whereas with Freud, it, it, it seemed like it was coming more from more of like a cold place. It didn't seem like there was a, a warmth there. Uh, so dreams were always sh kind of shrugged off or seen in different ways. And I think the important thing to, you know, to remember, I think with dreams is that these are your conscious experiences and they're about you. And if you explore your dreams, you're exploring your consciousness and you're exploring yourself. And that there can be amazing realms in which to get some work done. Like you said, a third of our life is spent dreaming. You can have amazing uh, adventures, not just adventures in consciousness, but healing and inspiration and exploration and learning. Like you can learn so much from your dreams if you just ask them. And if you're able to cultivate a practice where you become more conscious and aware in your waking time, you have more chances of becoming conscious and aware in your dream time, therefore becoming a lucid dreamer. And that's when it gets really exciting because you can start asking the dream to show you things and to teach you things and to heal you or to um, help you in some kind of way. So that's when it gets really exciting. And but of course, this has been happening for thousands of years. I mean, shamans have been doing this, witches have been doing this, um, sages have been doing this for uh, thousands and thousands of years, but we've lost this disconnect of this natural way of being. And um, another thing I'm passionate about is having people can, to connect back to this, to the exploration of consciousness in dream states and becoming a conscious dreamer. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I was reminded, um, I, I spent some time in Mongolia and it was this amazing trip. It was, I ended up leaving New York. I thought it was going to be a month and it kind of like we were talking about Luis, it ended up being two years. Um, but a, a portion of that, I was in Mongolia and I, I ended up getting this horse and I had like a tent and a sleeping bag and I, I just went off and it was this amazing time because Mongolia is this really interesting country where I mean for one that's that's the origin even of this word shaman and there's there's these deep uh, traditions there and 
But it was also so fascinating because of all the places I had been, it just seemed the least touched by humans. It, there was no roads, there was no power lines. It was just these huge, vast expanses for days, for weeks, I could go and not really see anyone. And, you know, serendipitously, if we want to call it that, or, you know, divine intervention, uh, you know, this was also before a smartphone. So when one was traveling, you'd maybe go to a cafe or something, and there was like a book exchange. So you'd, you'd leave an old book behind and you'd pick up a new one. And I found this book on lucid dreaming. And that was the book that, that I, I entered Mongolia with. So every night, that's just what I was reading. And I was, you know, sleeping under this vast expanse and silence and uh, it was a really magical time, but <clears throat> I remembered I would start to remember my dreams. And, and then, uh, you know, I read that we often have like four dream cycles per night. And then I'd start remembering two and then three. And then at one point I was like remembering all four. And I was just like, this is crazy. This is fascinating. And then I started having these dreams where I think there's a word for it, like a dreams of premonition. And I remember one very clearly, and I mean, even thinking about it, it almost <laughs> feels like a dream. Like I, I, sometimes I even question, were these things real? And yet I, I knew it was because it, it's something that stayed with me. But uh, I remember I was on this horse and in this dream, I, I was on the this horse, which was my horse at the time. And and I, I came to this like huge canyon and there was no way of crossing it. And I would have had to like go back for days on end to, to, to be able to, you know, find wherever it stopped and go around. And, um, but in this dream, I, I came to this canyon and I was like, okay, well, I guess there's nothing I can do. And, but in this dream, somehow this, this like intuition, this voice said, go left. And, and so I ended up going left and that wouldn't have been the way I went because it seemed like that just would have been going for, you know, infinity because it just kept going as, as far as I could see. So, but in the dream, it told me to go left. So I went left and, and, and I rode a while down and there was like this piece of rope strung across the canyon. And I was like, that's interesting. And so in the dream, I, I get off the horse and the horse runs off and, and somehow ends up on the other side of the canyon. And I, I climb across this rope, which was also a bit terrifying because it's, you know, there's this huge canyon below and I, who knows if this rope is even going to hold up. <laughs> but in the dream, I go across it and I end up on the other side. I find my horse and, and I keep going. The next day after this dream, I'm riding the horse and I come across this canyon and I'm like, oh shit, what am I gonna do? And this sense of like deja vu comes back and this recollection of the dream the night before. And I was like, this is crazy. Like I, I've seen this, I saw this in my dream last night. And again, you know, I would have gone a different direction but I remember in the dream it said, we'll go left. And so I go left and sure enough, there's this rope across this canyon and I get off my horse and you know there's this doubt like you know what are you doing this is crazy but I just trusted in this dream and and I, I crossed this rope and and then the horse found this like crazy path that I wouldn't have been able to go down but on it but he could and he met me on the other side and and we went off and I think it was the first time, like I would imagine things like that had happened before, but it was the first time where I was consciously aware of it and I followed mm -hmm. it. And I knew very clearly that that dream had taken place the night before. And I had that intuition and just that openness to remember it and to follow it. And it, for me, that was like very life-changing because, it, you know, that doesn't make sense on any level. <laughs> if we think about time, like in a linear sense, how is that possible? Like I dreamed of the future, but that's impossible from, from the way we think about time and space. And yet again, the, the more I've gone into this work with plants and, and, you know, shamanism, there's not inherently that view of linear time and space that, that mm -hmm. things can be accessed like that. And as you said, dreams can be premonitions or these gifts of wisdom, these teachings that then allow us 
to go into our lives. So do you have any sense of, of like what's happening in, in that, that's that space? Cause you also mentioned in the beginning, this idea of like questioning time and, and space. So yeah. in that dream space, like how is something like that possible? Because again, in, in, in the way we view the world, time is linear. So we can't dream of the future. And had I not had that dream, I wouldn't have believed that like, right. Cause things are linear. I, I can't dream of the future. And yet I did. I know it's me. And I love your dream. It made me so happy. So thanks for sharing <laughs> that. You know, I love hearing dreams because I feel tr transported into the experience. So that was really cool. Thanks for, exp and how cool was it that you had a horse too? I was like, <laughs> who has a horse in this day and age? It's amazing. <laughs> what a great trip that would have been in Mongolia. Cool. Um, yeah, time. So you, you experienced a precognitive dream and they're wonderful and they do make you wake up. And when you do have the, the experience with the dream unfolding in your waking reality, it, wow, it can just totally blow away the construct of what you think the nature of reality is. And I think that's a good thing and that's really healthy. And, but yes, it doesn't really fit within our current, uh, current construct of science right now. Uh, I think we're still in pretty much uh, most people view science or view time as linear, like a very Newtonian uh, concept of, of time and space. But of course that's changing with a lot of quantum theory and quantum time loop theory. And uh, there's so much more to understand. So we don't really understand time fully on how it works. Uh, just like the same as we don't know how consciousness works. What is, what is consciousness? You know, we still have this hard problem of consciousness that we're trying to work out. Is it quantitative? Can we, can we define it? Is it molecular? Is it something outside the brain? Is it something inside the brain? We can't locate it. So it holds a lot of mystery. So both time and consciousness, how does it work? And they both have to play with each other in order to bring about these precognitive states. So what I think happens with precognition is part of the flow state is part of being in that theta brainwave where it seems that you're able to access uh, something within the layer of time. The best way I can describe time, and of course I can't prove this because I'm not a physicist, but uh, ayahuasca once showed me how time worked and I thought it was really interesting and it got me very interested. And I described my experience to a few physicist friends, um, uh, colleagues, uh, afterwards, and they said, yeah, well, actually, that makes sense, you, you know, gauging, you know, quantum time loop theories and whatnot, you, what you saw in your ayahuasca experience could, in fact, be uh, something that you could hypothesize. So in my experience uh, with ayahuasca, where she took me into this column, and I was within this column, and it's so hard to articulate, <laughs> it was like a column of light. It was always in the infinite now moment. And it was very clear that I was in the now moment and that everything, every single moment that we experience is always now. Um, and in fact, there's no past and there's no future. It's just everything now. So she showed me that this in the, this column, uh, I saw all of these layers layers of light. So this looks, it, it felt very scientific what I was looking at. It almost felt very holographic in a way. And through all of these layers of light, uh, each layer was, was every single thought, every single action within history. And it was all happening now. So ancient Egypt happening now, uh, Plato in, <laughs> is happening now, you know, the reformation happening now, everything, happening in the now moment and when you get into this, this state of being within the now moment which is almost like a shutting down of the brain uh, that default network that we were talking about in the psychedelic experience it opened or slowing your brain waves it opens up space to be more in the now moment and access every experience in history uh, present moment. So 
time is not linear. It was, it was more of a column and, and we can retrieve the layers. So when we're having a precognitive experience, we are really in the now moment. We're able to, the layers are able to, we can access them more. Uh, they, they come to us more easily. Um, and we can also by will, this is me being very bold, by will try to bring them in as well so that we can feel like we've seen the future, you know, predictively look into the future. Now, our current construct of science wouldn't support this at all, of course. Um, and also there's the hard problem of consciousness as well. Um, how does consciousness interact with this modality of time? And so when we access a precognitive experience, uh, it can be interesting on many levels too, because you can have a precognitive hit or precognitive moment in a dream. And say the moment in your dream goes badly. You get into a car, it's a blue car, and in the dream, there's a crash. Now, three days later, uh, you're in your waking reality and a friend says, hi, I'm gonna come pick you up and they pick you up and you're, they pull up in a blue car and you're having a deja vu of the moment. And so you could, you know, feel like, oh, I don't want to be superstitious. Uh, I'll get into the car or I will be superstitious and avoid going in the car. Or you could get into the car and just be very mindful about being in the present moment with your friend driving. So you remember the dream and you remember the outcome, but you, you're in the car now thinking, well, I hope we don't have a crash. So you just mentioned something to your friend. Oh, can we take some quieter streets? Or can we, you know, you just give a little bit of a, a little bit of a tip and you're able to, you know, and then everything happens without, you know, without any kind of uh, crash or anything coming to be like your dream. So precognition can be used in a way, and you know, of course you can't prove this and it's something that's very understudied, but I myself have done it a lot. I've known lots of friends who've done it. I know children of friends who, who do this and articulate it to me that, oh yeah, my, I have dreams that tell me not to do something. And then when it starts happening, I make the choice so it doesn't happen that way. So it's almost like a way of rewriting the future so it's like, how does this feedback loop work? Uh, it's a great mystery, but I think it's there in order for us to play with. I do think that uh, this amazing thing called life and the universe is there for us to, to, to work with. Uh, it's um, not for us to feel stuck within. I think we, we have more ability than we know in order to co-create something very unique and interesting. Um, and of course, that's the realms of an explorer. And I think many people have lost their, their spark of exploration because we do get stuck in the material reductionist perspective of this is all there is. Uh, Nothing can be backed by science right now, so why believe in anything? And there's no room to explore. And so I think it's again going back to this almost like childlike state where there is a an openness to like let's see what is possible. Let is let's push the envelope and 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 try it out. Try out lucid dreaming. Uh, try to induce precognition. What do you have to lose? <laughs> it's just the, the nature of an explorer um, to always be uh, looking that way. Um, incident incidentally, uh, with precognition too, there's an amazing plant that helps uh, trigger precognition. Of course, it's not been proven um, by any kind of science. Of course, there's probably no interest in collecting the data, but something I'm very passionate about and hopefully will within the coming years start collecting data on it. But it's the beautiful little plant here. I, I was I hugged it earlier. Um, and it's Art Artemisia uh, vulgaris, it's mugwort. And you probably heard of mugwort, but it seems to induce precognition. And I mean, for me, it certainly does. And I, when I teach my students uh, working with Winnerogens and 
plants that help uh, induce dreams, we keep in touch through the process of the of, of the training and of the of our classes in our course, working with these plants like every single night, uh, to to pay attention to their dreams. A part of it is dream journaling and seeing how precognition is unfolding, and it's pretty uncanny. I mean, I really think that you know it's amazing. So for some reason, this little plant and it's got a long history of being used for divination not just in shamanism, but also in European witchcraft. And these two places didn't even know each other existed. This little plant seems to trigger it. So it's it's pretty cool. Um, I've been working with it every night this week. I've been working with it for many years, but because I'm on a course right now, all of me and my students were all doing our kind of dieta with it every single night. And the precognition is amazing. I've even had one um, uh, today, uh, cause I had a dream last night, um, which was a lucid dream and it involved, uh, some star Wars robots and vehicles, which to me came out of nowhere. And it was, uh, I don't watch, uh, TV and I don't, I've, it's not on my radar. It was not something anyone's talked to me about. No one said the word star Wars, to me, like, you know, very, you know, it's not on my radar. So I've written it down. I, you know, told my students because we keep in touch every day. So here I am. I have this lucid dream, and maybe I'm tapping into the collective unconscious somehow. And we, we just put it out because we want to compare notes as well through our journeying. But then here we are on our conversation today, and you mentioned you said the word Star Wars just out of nowhere. <laughs> we were talking about <laughs> we were talking about ancient ideologies, and you mentioned Star Wars. I kind of like I sort of laughed. I went, "Okay, there it is. It's it's jumped in. It's come in. Uh, <laughs> mission complete." So it comes up in many different ways when you work with this plant. You can have uh, dreams that just are like random and you'll have many during the night like up to six a night so very active dreaming many many of them and then over the next few days a few weeks these synchronicities come in they just fill in the blank you're like okay there it is oh there it is like I'll give another example the other night I was I was working with my brewer drinking it I dreamt of um, Luis and Luis was in my dreams and we were chatting and talking and he was like uh, tree, you need to get down here to Peru and you got to stay for one month and even named the month as well. And it was all really specific. And when I woke up, I was like, wow, that, that was interesting. So vivid uh, speaking with uh, him and, and just and being like with him and having this really detailed conversation. And then um, you know, within five hours, uh, I get a text message from him out of the blue, uh, <laughs> just chatting and going, you know what, you need to come down here. <laughs> you need to, you know, uh, he's like, I talk about your dreaming practice to the people here at the retreat. You know, and I was just like, this is great. So this is just an example of, of mugwort. And that's just two little examples of something that's happened in the last two days. But um, it seems to activate the precognition. And it seems to help aid in that. So this is the, this is our little friend when it comes to that. So I do think we can step into precognition. I think through intention, we can also through the guidance of working with a plant ally, uh, strengthen it as well. And then once it opens up these um, states of consciousness, you can also find those states of consciousness when you're awake and you are doing a meditation and through an intention, just like, it's almost like you know how to just drop into that zone um, because the plants helped you get there. So sometimes people get precognition like just spontaneous, spontaneously and then you can work at it as well. So I, th I think this is also an amazing expansion of our abilities as conscious beings too, is developing that outside of time and space, whatever it looks like, if it's a column, if it's a whatever. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's interesting because I, I also remember on that trip, um, this was later, but it was also one of these things that really enforced that, that idea of dreams was, 
I, I had a very vivid dream of a friend of mine who I hadn't talked to in probably like 20 years. I mean, nothing. And a very vivid dream of him. I remember it when I woke up. And then I, at, uh, at this point, you know, I was checking emails once in a while. And I, I went to check an email and he reached out to me. And again, that could be written off as just, you know, coincidence or probability. But it seems like the probability of that would be tremendously rare. Uh, I mean, maybe if it was someone I was in regular contact with and then I have a dream and okay but someone who I hadn't talked to in 20 years and then a very vivid dream. And then there's a message waiting for me. It also reminded me um, when you're talking about the, the car story, my, my uncle has always felt really connected to his dreams. And um, according to him, these kind of things happen all the time. And, but it, it reminded me of one of the stories he was telling me with the car because he, he had this very vivid dream where he was in a car, he was driving down the road and all of a sudden this car came, he got to like an intersection, he went through the intersection, the light was green and all of a sudden a car came through the intersection, plowed them into the side. He was, he was in the car with his wife and they died. Sure enough, a, a few days later, a few weeks later, he was uh, driving and he came to this intersection. It was a green light. And all of a sudden he got this deja vu feeling and he slowed down and like basically slammed on the brakes and all of the cars behind him were like honking, like, what are you doing there and there and there? And even his wife was like, Gary, his name is Gary. Like, what are you doing? And he said, wait, I just had this deja vu. I, we can't go through. And she's like, but it's a green light. And he's like, no, no. And all of a sudden this car just goes through the intersection and he saw, you know, it would have hit him. It, it, that dream was real in a way. So, so you mentioned this idea. Do you think some people are just inherently connected in that way? Some people for whatever reason are just born being more connected that way? Or do you think it's, it's something that can be worked on in practice because you mentioned this idea that, that there are ways that we can begin to tap into that or potentially it's just, it, it's some of both. Some people just naturally for whatever reason are, are interested in that or are called to do that, but that for anyone, there are ways that they can begin to cultivate that as well. Yeah, I think it's a, a bit of both. I, I think some people might be, you know, born with a propensity to have precognitive experiences. And sometimes I wonder too, if it's hereditary as well, because I certainly know with both my mom and my dad, they, they both have had precognition in dream states, also waking states. My dad famously in our family had like a waking, like a vision of fire the day before our childhood home burnt down in a tragic accident. Um, so in, Several people in my family seem to have precognitive experiences. Um, I certainly have had them as through dreaming and also just being wide awake or sitting in sessions with people, uh, getting precognitive hits. So is it genetic? Is it passed down? Is it hereditary? It's very mysterious, but it's definitely something you can cultivate as well. So that's something I guide people through, um, especially working with plant work. Um, and also various techniques and tools that you can do to deepen your senses. And a lot of them are meditation based, where you are tuning your conscious awareness into the present moment, but not just the present moment of self and source. You're going beyond self. So it's almost like you put your self aside. You're like, I'm putting myself aside and I'm, you just tune your awareness into every subtle detail of your environment, you know, all the layers of sound that you can hear and sense, everything, you're, everything, you, know, you move through all the senses, move through your hearing, your sight, your senses, your touch, uh, smelling, um, these sort of things can help a lot, just build your intuition and, and get you into this, you know, this, um, I guess it's a state, a state of consciousness that we were speaking about, almost like a flow state. And that's where you can seem to access this precognitive material. Another place you can access precognitive material is in the liminal states before sleep and as you're waking up. So the threshold states, uh, the threshold state just before you fall asleep is called the hypnagogic state. 
And just before you're waking up, it's called the hypnopopic state. And these two states um, are incredible for receiving insight and precognitive hits as well. It's also a really great uh, space for remote viewing. So that's the concept of being able to uh, see, view something from another location, that's another location on the other side of the world uh, with quite a good amount of clarity. And uh, remote viewing, you could look it up, it's got a long history and it's, it was even used by the CIA and there was lots of different um, uh, training for CIA operatives to, to be able to do this skill in order to, of course, spy and uh, receive information from, you know, the enemy. Uh, but this is, you know, remote viewing goes back far time. So even, shama, you know, shama, shamanism um, is, is a big part of it. And you can view through the eyes of animals and shape shift, you know, it's called shape shifting in some um, traditions, but it's, it's, it's effectively the ability to be able to have your consciousness experience vision through different vantage points. And it seems as though in that hypnagogic state, you can access that phenomenon as well. Of course, this is all understudied in nature or the construct of science would be like, that's totally not <laughs> something that you could do, uh, but the CIA funded it. So there must be something to it. Um, so in that liminal threshold, you can experience the uh, precognitive material. Um, and it usually is if you can keep your conscious awareness there without falling asleep, you know? So it's, if you can imagine your body, it's like mind awake or consciousness awake, body asleep. So you allow yourself to lay there and observe your body going into the shutdown sleep mode. Uh, it gets into the hypnagogic state, which has a lot of cool phenomenon that happens with it. Uh, you might experience uh, sacred geometry and a lot of little dream, dream visions forming. You can hear things, you feel like you hear sounds in the room or snippets of conversations that pass in and out. And you can get sensations in your body too, just a, a sense of electricity or vibrations forming within your body. And if you're able to hold your awareness on that state, um, that is a really amazing time to receive anything precognitive. Now, of course, you don't know if it's precognitive at the time because the thing didn't come to pass yet. So, <laughs> but uh, if you're able to record these things, that's why part of the conscious dreaming practice is to record any of your experiences in dreams or in these liminal states. Because then when it happens at a future date, you can go, right, yes, I can see the link now. Uh, so you can also experience this when you're waking up in the hypnopompic state and receiving little precognitive hits as well. And I think the reason why you experience them in those threshold states is that your consciousness is, is engaged enough to receive and remember, and your brain waves have slowed down to theta, or they're, you know, they're slowing down to the flow state. So it almost seems like it's the sweet spot. You know, if you can imagine your consciousness, your brain is tuning into a different frequency, almost to a different plane or zone. And it seems like that is the place in which you can receive it. So that's a really fun place to, to practice. Um, and of course, working with Mugwort is a really great way to practice as well and recording your dreams. And of course, with precognition, you don't know it's precognition until it happens. But as you get become a seasoned dreamer, conscious dreamer, you do start understanding the feeling when you are experiencing something precognitive as well. It holds a quality to it. Uh, and you can awaken feeling like, I think that was precognitive. So you get to understand uh, the energy around it and how it feels slightly different from a seemingly normal dream. And it's a, like a waking with a knowing. And it's also an waking with an intuition, like, I think this is going to come to pass. I'm just going to keep my wits about me. I'm just going to wait for it because I have a feeling. And that's kind of how it rolls. 
Um, but yeah, definitely something you can cultivate. Um, and I think we all have great potential as humans and we don't even, we've just scraped the surface of consciousness and indeed possibly uh, as we evolve as a species, maybe, you know, in the future, we'll be lucid dreaming every night that uh, people will be precogning all the time. <laughs> you know, maybe this will just be like standard, you know, for uh, our uh, future humans. <laughs> mm. It's interesting because you, you mentioned this idea of plants and one of the plants I, I do a lot of work with is, is tobacco, the, the ingestion of tobacco and um one of the the things that it really does where that teaching comes from with that plant is um i'm probably going to butcher the words but that hypnagogic and hypnopopic state it's it, it very much puts one in that state we you know we often describe it as or i describe it as this this state where you're not quite asleep and you're not quite awake and you're not sure if you're asleep and you're not sure if you're awake and it, 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 in essence, it puts you in that state for an extended period of time, maybe hours, maybe the whole night. And a lot of the teaching, a lot of the insight comes through that space. So, yeah, I find that really, really interesting. You, you mentioned this idea of lucid dreaming. Maybe you can define that because I think there's a lot of maybe confusion around what lucid dreaming mm -hmm. is. And then also like what is the balance between because we're all conscious in our dreams whether we know it or not it, like we can't be otherwise there's just our consciousness so <laughs> we're, we're there where else would we be it's just obviously we, we may not remember it but what it, what do you think is that that difference or that line between when to make a dream lucid to to have not only consciousness but volition within that dream versus allowing whatever that dream is 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 arising to happen to us and and following that without necessarily trying to dictate where that's going yeah really good questions and you know i should probably define lucid dreaming in layman's terms because even though there's a lot of information out there sometimes people are think that lucid dreaming is some just a vivid dream and it's just a dream that's just very colorful and <laughs> surreal but by definition a lucid dream is a dream where you are completely aware that you are dreaming and so you are cognitively very present within the dream you're aware that you are who you are in the dream state that you can interact with the characters in your dream you can you have a will and decision making can happen within the dream uh, so it's got specific uh, qualities to it that makes it uniquely different from a seemingly normal dream. And even though human beings have been doing lucid dreaming for thousands of years, and there's lots of different examples throughout history from Vedic texts to ancient Greek documents, um, we only have basically scientifically proven it in the late 1970s. <laughs> So this is an example, you know, of, um, you know, it's out there, this is something that happens, but then science catches up and often in many cases, the mystics, the shamans, the poets and the artists get there first. And then it's science that basically catches up afterwards. So this is that concept of being an explorer, come on, being open and just going for it. So with, um, with consciousness in the dream, with lucidity within a dream, I really see consciousness and the concept of lucidity as a spectrum. So if you were to look at a spectrum and on one end of the spectrum, you have total 100% lucidity, completely vivid in the now, so conscious and aware and so present. And that's almost like that clear light moment. It's like the moment we have when, you know, when you have a mystical experience, when you're in a psychedelic experience, when you're in a lucid dream, when you have an orgasm, when, you know, like those moments that you're in the moment. So that's 100% lucidity. On the other side of the scale, we have out like a light, you're gone. <laughs> it's like totally unconscious. So in between there, we have varying degrees of awareness. So maybe perhaps when, you know, we, in our day-to-day -day walking through life, we're we're kind of maybe somewhere in the middle, if not maybe even down towards sleepwalking 
<laughs> end of things where even though we're alive and awake, we're kind of sleepwalking through life. You know, we're running lists in our head. We're constantly in our thoughts. We're not with the present moment. Uh, we're not having these clear light moments. So in our dreams, it's very much the same too. So we can have a dream where we are like silent observer. We, we are just watching the dream unfold. We're not aware really that we're dreaming. Uh, it feels like we're just watching a film possibly. And those dreams are valid too, though, because we can have dreams where uh, we observe something and learn a lot without being fully aware that we're dreaming. So it's still very valid. But then we'll have parts of the evening where we're out like a light. We have no conscious awareness of what was going on. And it's hard to get dream memory recall. And then we'll have our lucid dream, which is like almost it is a mystical experience because it does make people wake up feeling changed. Like much like your dream when the, in the, with the horse in Mongolia and wow, uh, how it all transpired afterwards with the synchronicities. So with a lucid dream, we come into a total peak of awareness within the dream itself. Usually something unusual happens in the dream that makes us conscious and aware that something's happened, that we are dreaming. It could be a, a strange dream character doing something. It could be a, an animal attacking us, but something happens that's a, to jolt us into the now moment to be awake and then you stay within the dream and then you realize I'm dreaming and so when someone realizes they're dreaming and they start to interact with their dream uh, it can be a mind-blowing experience uh, because you realize that <laughs> this is pretty cool like that my consciousness can experience this whole other realm uh, so tangibly and so clear and I'm interacting um, I think one of the fallacies with lucid dreaming, and you see this a lot online, is that these promises of being able to control the dream and uh, do anything you want in the dream and you can fly around and have sex with celebrities and do extreme sports and it's like it's like a virtual reality video game and this is really appealing to our you know gamer generation that is like we're currently in and the escape mentality that we want because many of us want to escape from the construct of this capitalistic consumer hardcore system that makes us very very unhappy and disconnected so many people want to use lucid dreaming just for the escape factor and it often reminds me of that terry gilliam film brazil you know his characters working in this really like mundane existence of this like kind of future uh world uh where everyone's like a wage slave in these little cubicles and it, life really sucks. And so he goes home at night and has these lucid dreams that he's like this flying amazing man. And he had, you know, he's got this whole other life in his dream world. So uh, lucid dreaming usually gets, you know, contributed towards this escape mode, but I really feel it's more than that. I mean, obviously when you first start to lucid dream, you want to, control the dream. So you see a dream character and you want to control them to your will. So you want them to kiss you or hug you or do things um, uh, in, in ways, or you want to fly. And, and so lucid dreamers end up doing this mostly when they first start to lucid dream. And then at a certain point, uh, you realize that sometimes the dream doesn't want to be controlled. Um, and I often guide a lot of like seasoned lucid dreamers who come to me and say I'm having a really hard time I I'm a prolific lucid dreamer I can't do it anymore every time I have a lucid dream uh, the dream shuts down I can't control it or I'm having a dry spell so I always uh, love to work with these types of dreamers because I bring them into the to the next level of looking at the dream in a different way I really think that the dream itself, um, it doesn't want to con it doesn't want to be controlled. It wants to work with you. If you can see the dream itself as being alive, the dream is, is conscious as well. And it's alive. And it wants to co-create with you. So I think it allows you to control it to a certain extent just to kind of get you used to how to work in that realm. But after a while, after that initiation's done, it says, no, you need to move beyond. Now it's time to learn from the dream. Now it's time to surrender. So when you approach the dream, lucid dreaming from a sense of openness, 
um, outside of the ego construct of wanting to control, and to have your way, and to approach it from a, show me, teach me, I want to learn something. Go lucid and say, show me something, teach me something. It gets really interesting, and the dream will show you something. The dream will take you somewhere. I remember the first time in lucid dreams when I realized that I couldn't control it, and I, I lost my, my ability to fly. And I was like, oh, no, I can't fly anymore. I used to know how to fly. And, and I just, um, I decided to just let the dream take me somewhere to show me. I just kind of relinquished control. And then all of a sudden, the dream just picked, it, picked me up and I started flying me places and teaching me things. And I, that's how I approach lucid dreaming now and how I teach all of my students and guide them is to surrender to the dream, work with it. It's like an ayahuasca experience or any plant medicine experience. If you are communing with ayahuasca or the sacred mushroom or San Pedro, you don't control them. You say, I surrender to you. Show me, teach me, master, teach me, teacher. And uh, they will teach you. But if you try to control them, uh, it's going to be, <laughs> it's just, it's terrible. It doesn't work out, you know? And so it's like, um, it's a bit like that. It's a, it's a bit lucid dreaming is a, a beautiful act of surrender to the dream. It's also seeing the dream from a sort of different vantage point uh, that it is almost conscious in its own right, that there is something there that can teach you. It gets so cool and mind blowing, Jason. You know, you could just say, teach me things. And I've woken up from lucid dreams where it was showing me how, you know, scientific things work. And I'm like, I'm not even a science person. I've had lucid dreams um, uh, give me music. And I've woken up with like pieces of music and I've composed them. So I've bridged them over and it gets very exciting. So I think, um, you know, if we can move beyond that, concept of control and just just surrender to it uh it gets so mind-blowing and i think we can go further and further and further with this exploration as we uh practice and explore it's it's amazing <laughs> as you can see i'm so excited about it <laughs> you, you spoke a few times of this word as uh, synchronicity what, what does that mean to you because I, I think for a lot of people the more they go into these modalities of work that's something that becomes more prevalent in their lives is some sort of like undeniable thing that that something is working that's maybe beyond my comprehension but that it seems to be pointing me towards something whether that's just being more aware being more present seeing that there's a, a greater force at play and a, an appreciation a gratitude and awe what is the, what does that mean for you synchronicities and, and why do you think those are important synchronicities are fun i see them as like cosmic winks and almost like cosmic jokes and i do think that the universe is just full of high humor um i never really saw that uh, universe being that way before um even though I've had my, my path through life, um, I grew up with a heavy dose of uh, cynicism. Um, I'm from Generation X and Generation X, we are a cynical generation. Um, and of course the cynic, uh, you know, was, was quite big in me, you know, in many, in many ways. Um, even though I've had mystical experiences, it's just something that, you know, culturally it, it does um, uh, rub off on you a little bit, you know? And I remember when I started, um, first started, I had a lot of synchronicities in life. We're just talking about my death doula experiences. That was all synchronicity, but still I doubted it, right? I was like, uh, you know, is this a coincidence? And then I started taking it personally. Is it me? Am I making this happen? Um, but I, I, I started to, um, the cynic in me dissolved. It dissolved the first time I, I, I um, went uh, for an ayahuasca journey. First time I, I used, worked with ayahuasca, my cynical and critical, skeptic, critic, cynic side of me <clears throat> blew apart, absolutely shattered. And she showed me the cosmic joke. She showed me uh, high humor and because she's such a trickster. 
And it was from that day forward that I, I really embraced synchronicity. And I had synchronicity all through my life, but of course I would be like scratching my head over it. But after that experience with ayahuasca, I embraced it with pure joy and without a cynical heart and without doubt. And so synchronicity, I see it as a, a cosmic wink and I see it as a way of uh, the universe kind of going, I told you so. And uh, it's fun. Um, and, <laughs> and it's also part of an integration process. So it can help us in an integrative way because we can have a profound experience and afterwards uh, not be able to integrate that experience properly. And we can have it in dreaming, like a lucid dream or even just a precog dream or a normal dream. We can have it in a mystical experience, a psychedelic experience. And if we don't in, in, integrate our experiences properly, we can we can leave loose ends and and sometimes, um, you know, it's not a fix it pill. You know, you take a do a plant ceremony afterwards. It, you still got to do the work. You know, there's integration. There's uh, talking it through, there's processing it, reflecting, there's still things to do. So I think with these synchronicities, they pop up to encourage us to continue the process of integration. They're there as these beautiful little like um, symbols in a way to say, yeah, you're doing it. Keep it up, kiddo, keep it up. And uh, this is, you're on the right track and this is the way to go. Uh, they can also pop up to, you know, their prompts, they get our attention, uh, go turn left, turn right, talk to this person, get in touch with that person. And they're wonderful. And I, I see them, I don't see them anymore as mere coincidences, like as an uncanny coincidence. I don't shrug them off. I just, uh, I just feel their joy when they pop up. I just go, ah, like it makes me laugh and I just get a little buzz, buzz from them. I don't feel like I need uh, my synchronicities validated. I feel like I don't, when I was younger, I used to be like, and then this happened and this happened and doesn't that prove something? And I don't feel like that anymore. I don't feel like I need to have people go, yeah, yeah, thumbs up, it proves it. I just, just feel the knowing and I go, oh, shit, thanks for that, you know? wherever that's coming from. And it just helps me along my way. So the synchronicities can be helpful in so many aspects. They can encourage us on the way. They can be confirmations. They can be part of our integration process. Uh, like uh, I told you so. Uh, and they're just full of cosmic humor as well and wonderful. And they also sometimes are little breadcrumbs that are beckoning us to follow them too. So some synchronicities have been amazing for people because it meant that they moved location and then they met a person that they needed to meet and lots of cool things can come uh, from following the synchronistic signs as well. So again, it goes back to that playfulness, you know, that openness and, you know, that childlike play. If you watch kids play, I don't have kids myself, but I seem to like attract them. Uh, but if you watch kids play, they they play in very intuitive ways, but also synchronistically. They follow the synchronicities, you know. They they just they follow the the thread, and it's cool, and it allows them to um, you know learn. Uh, they learn from their environment, and they it's just wonderful. And that's something I bring in a lot in my retreats. I, I bring in play a lot, and also. Uh, engaging in synchronicity in your environment is mostly in nature. We do a lot of walks out into nature and I call them walking dreams. So we in, engage with our environment and walking dreams. Everyone goes out for an hour on their own and people come back with the most amazing synchronicity stories just from one hour's walk in a very present way in nature where it's just, it's so cool. So there's something to be said again about going back to that theta brainwave that childlike openness that can bring in the synchronicities even more as well so i think you were right with the present awareness and being more in the present moment you can see them more and then it seems to trigger more so it's like this really cool like knock-on effect and also when you work with plants it happens a lot too so 
uh, after all my plant medicine journeys, there's always an, a whole array of synchronicities that are so amazing that have happened afterwards. Even from like just the very next day, something happening, I'm like, no way. And just uh, there's something about the plants that seems to activate it as well. So, you know, it's cool. It's cool stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, one thing I, I wanted to ask you in the beginning, you mentioned this idea of sleep paralysis. And I think that's something uh, actually quite a few people experience. And what is your what is your take with what's going on there? Because it, it, again, it seems to be a fairly f common phenomena where someone just wakes up and it, it's like they can't move. It's almost this out of body experience. And sometimes it can be very terrifying for people. They feel like maybe they're being choked or attacked. Uh, do you have any sense of what's what's going on when when that's happening? Yeah, so sleep paralysis is like a, a sleep state, sleep phenomenon where um, effectively you completely wake up and uh, become conscious uh, when your body is in the paralyzed state. So uh, throughout our sleep cycles through uh, the evening um, and into the time when we wake up, our body uh, goes into a state of paralysis during our REM cycle. Now this happens uh, biologically for a few reasons, mostly so we don't act out our dreams and we don't kick around and flail about. <laughs> uh, so there's probably, you know, there's a protectionist uh, uh, aspect going on there. So um, our, our brain releases a few chemicals and compounds that, that create a, a paralyzed state. So. What happens in sleep paralysis is we gain consciousness in that state so it can feel absolutely horrifying uh, because we can't uh, arouse our body to wake it up and it can feel very freaky um, also we're still in between brain waves too so being in the theta brain wave uh, brings about its phenomenon too uh, so we can experience um, a sense of uh, presence within the room, that, uh, that there's sensations in our bodies, uh, it can feel like buzzing and electrical feelings, it can um, feel like we're hearing things within the room, like either voices or sounds, some people uh, report, I've had this a lot, um, buzzing, whirring sounds, like electrical, electricity sounds, like very specific sounds, static it's very interesting. Um, and then also vision, like seeing things within the room itself, seeing apparitions, entities, people feel like they've seen either like a ghost, shadow figures, aliens, people, you know, you name it. And so it can be very frightening because of the sense of fight or flight kicks in because you feel like there's people in the room or there's something on me that's crushing me. Some people feel like some of these entities strangle or they're trying to uh, hurt you in some kind of way. And it's, I see it as a, as a threshold state that often happens before you have an out of body experience. So with an out of body experience, it is the phenomenon in which your consciousness uh, disconnects from your sleeping body. So you have this disassociation like very clearly and vividly and you're aware as where as we are right now, that you are you know, at the top of your ceiling and that your bed and your body is down there below you. Um, so with the sleep paralysis state, usually that's the state that you're in before you can leave your body. Now you can induce this, you can induce an out of body experience by uh, observing your body fall into the sleep state, but re retain consciousness and through intention, be able to will yourself to disconnect. But I think people fall into sleep paralysis and they have these experiences. I think it's like almost like a form of initiation, like that you're going into these places because you're called to like, yeah, explore, go a little bit deeper. Um, and perhaps there's some scary material to look at there, but that's all good too. Um, because perhaps there's something there for you to transcend and move beyond. Uh, move beyond the fear. So I had prolific sleep paralysis since a teenager. And it was like, 
some of the experiences just were crazy scary and like you know and it feels like it's really happening as we are happening right now and they felt like the experiences felt very profound as well and and I felt like curious by them. And there wasn't a lot of material about that then. Uh, this was pre-internet, you know, this is like the late 80s and 90s and uh, moving forward, obviously there's more information on it, but I saw it as a way of, even though it was scary as hell, I was like, I want to work with this. I want to get beyond this. So I learned ways to, uh, to temper the fear and what really helped was when I started uh, taking up a meditation practice. So I guide students now, anyone I guide uh, through sleep paralysis as, you go to places you can handle, you got this, there's something for you beyond the fear of this. So let's get you working, holding space for the fear, moving beyond the fear so you can get to what's on the other side of that. And how I guide them through that is uh, I, I help uh, induce sleep paralysis. So I have like techniques that bring it on, which they you know, you're like, that's crazy. Why would you want to bring on? But you bring on the sleep paralysis so you can practice holding space for yourself through the fear. So um, if you have a meditation practice, it's helpful because as you know, with meditation, you have a mind of equanimity. You're able to be in observer mo mode. You don't uh, get carried away in, in the emotion and downward spiral where you go. So when you're having sleep paralysis, the sensations are coming up. You can hear the sounds. You just hold space. You're like, I'm observing the sensations. Um, I know I'm having sleep paralysis. I'm not afraid. It's all good. And then the shadow entities or whatever it is comes into the room. Okay, there we go. There's like a shadow, there's an entity in the room. I'm not afraid. <laughs> I have a mind of equanimity. It's all good. Then the shadow entity comes at you and it's trying to strangle you. And then you're like, this is okay. This is getting, and you're feeling it too. So how do you hold, hold, hold space for that? So um, I've taught many of my students to access a, a source place of love. I know it sounds like cheesy, but love, accessing the place of love, because most of what we traverse through, through this human ex experience, which is, you know, a challenging experience, is, is, is working through both polarities of fear and love. These are the two base notes of our existence, where we're striving and constantly moving in and out of fear and love and everything comes down to those two things, it would seem. So in the sleep paralysis situation, um, you can either act upon it with fear or love. So you got something scary coming at you. So you could either feed it fear, which seems to amplify it. It, it does, you know, you're like, ah, and you're scared and it gets worse and worse and you're trying to scream and it just spirals and it's, it just becomes a fearful whole thing. Whereas if you access love and you consciously with your intention go, I'm sending it love. And you see it as almost like a superpower coming out of your chest. And I've done this and I've had students do it and it works. And so accessing that and just through choice, just going, no, I'm blasting this with love. You cannot destroy me or hurt me. And you know, you're not, you're, you're not going to get me into the fear mode. So you, you send love and it dissipates it. So that's one way of getting through it. Another way of getting through it, sometimes the entities aren't coming at you, is just simply uh, observing the vibrations with equanimity and then making a choice like, okay, I'm going to, I am not just my body. I'm also this consciousness. So um, through my intention and will, I'm gonna let my consciousness uh, disconnect. So you can do that in different ways. You can will it to, um, to sit up. Sometimes people need to get there physically at first. And then, you know, when you s will your consciousness to sit up, it's almost like, I guess it would be called the astral body. Let that sit up. Some people, you can will it to roll out. So you roll out on your side. Uh, you can will it to spiral out off the, off the top of your head. So just like a spiral motion. Or you could just will it to be at a different vantage point. So will it up to be uh, the, the 
the corner of the, your ceiling and then you're there. So you get to work with it, but by working with it, you need to overcome the fear of it at first. Beyond that, it gets interesting. So in an out-of-body experience, it's like you're there, you're in your room. It's very different from a lucid dream because you're actually in your room and you are just pure awareness uh, with no body. And you're able to do things like pass through walls and you're able to like uh, uh, move into mirrors and create portals and travel to different places and fly and see different vantage points. And only able to be disconnected for a certain amount of time. And there seems to be a bit of a time limit in the physics of this whole situation where you're then eventually snapped back to your body. But in the time that you're there, you can learn some pretty cool things. And also there's precognition that you can catch there as well. Uh, there's a bit of time travel that you can experience there as well. I know it sounds mind blowing. But there's a total different physics going on in that, I guess they would call it the uh, astral plane. And it's almost like the dimension between uh, our material reductionist reality and possibly the realms of, of lucid dreams or somewhere in between. And I also liken it a lot to the Tibetan process of the bardo work and um, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, that there's a lot of various um, entities that you come up against when you are traversing through the Bardo, uh, through the, de the death process, the transition. And I always see the sleep paralysis and the astral plane is kind of like that zone because sometimes you get these, these, yeah, like these entities that seem to have their own free will. Uh, appearing and almost seems like a challenge that you need to like overcome the fear of this thing in order to whew, get to the next level. Now, whether they're a projection of our own mind, a projection of our own unconscious zone, or if they are actually discarnate like uh, entities or beings of we free will and choice, uh, don't know what exactly that is, but either way, it seems kind of like an initiation. And so if you're able to move beyond the fear, it gets you into a more transcendent, deeper space of conscious exploration and awareness. So maybe that's what the Tibetan Book of the Dead kind of was tapping in on a little bit too there, because it seems like there's an initiatory process with that as well in these liminal spaces. So I know that there's a biological function to sleep paralysis, but I do think that there's some cool conscious exploration you could do in the process uh, that can be really interesting. And I just love the out-of-body experience. And over the years, I've found these new ways of working with the physics in those realms that like creating portals and working with energy. And I'm just like, whoa, this is amazing. And, you know, it's just so fantastic. Uh, so yeah, moving beyond the fear. I think everything is about moving beyond the fear. And, and and getting into the love, you know, uh, that, that seems to be like the magic power <laughs> for any that drives anything. <laughs> yeah, that's a beautiful way of putting it. <laughs> Two of the other things you mentioned that, that I'm curious about, uh, one was this idea of divination, and maybe you can talk a bit about that and, and what that is and what draws you to it. And you also mentioned a couple of times this idea of witches and, and using plants and I think we all, you know, so many of us, we grew up in a culture where, like, I remember as a kid watching The Wizard of Oz, and it was the Wicked Witch and Green Face, and uh, I mean, even, you know, even here in Peru, you know, witch is a derogatory term. It's a bruja or a brujo, and and it, it it's these people who are evil in a way, and you know, there, I'm, there's a whole long history of persecution and and all of these things, but what do you think that really means like like to be a, a witch and what does that embody and and uh because it seems like we have such a distorted view of what that is because it's it's interesting in mexico the bruja is also synonymous with the curandera it's the two words are the same and and it seems to me that's a much closer reality <laughs> is that 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 is the the, the healer the, the one who works with plants the one who uh, explores, as you, you use, I think is a beautiful word, an explorer of these realms of consciousness and, and dream states. And 
So yeah, maybe those two topics. I'm I'm curious about divination and and also this this idea of of witches. Yeah, so witches witches get a bad rap. Actually, the word <laughs> witch comes from the word Wicca, which means wise one. So they were the people that held some wisdom. So it's like, where did they get this wisdom? And what is this wisdom that they're talking about? The wisdom is the wisdom of the plants, the wisdom in the relationship with the, I guess in modern terms, we could call it plant consciousness, but in ancient terms, it would be the forest spirits or the elementals. And having that wisdom and working closely with the wisdom of nature, and also working with the wisdom of the realms of that which you cannot see. So it would be um, tuning in, like I was saying, into those flow states where you're able to receive insight, receive information, uh, talk, receive information from the ancestors, you know, talk to the dead, um, receiving information from them that there's no way you could know, like names and and sentiments. Uh, so working in those flow states, uh, that's how I see a, a witch or even a shaman. And so the origins is, is wise one. And the wisdom is not the wisdom that we would have in this world, you know, like, uh, I'm really wise because I know how to work the stock market. It's not that kind of wisdom. It's like, it's a wisdom that's, uh, you know, uh, slightly different from that. But why do we have this wisdom? Uh, why do witches have this wisdom? The wisdom is there to help others. So it's not wisdom to hold power over other people. Although there are witches and shamans that, that do hold, that have uh, these abilities or are able to access these zones of wisdom. But then, yeah, they do hold it over other people and they're able to abuse that. Uh, but ultimately um, it's there to, I think, in an altruistic way to help to help the community, um, to help other people, uh, which is to have, uh, we're still suffering the hangover of the witch trials and the great, um, <laughs> you know, the great burnings of all the witches that have happened, you know, and not just in Europe, you know, that's the famous one where we do have a body count and we know that there was thousands and thousands, over 50,000, mostly women who were burned at the stake for having wisdom connected to the, <laughs> connected to this. Um, and we're seen as a threat to modern science, to a threat to the church, which we're pretty much uh, working in conjunction. And uh, we're wanted to step in as the middleman uh, for this knowledge uh, because it made money. Um, many witches, they would do it for free. You know, they were the wise women of the, of the village and they, you know, helped bringing the babies into the world, helped uh, people when they were on their way out dying. And they were the ones that you came to with herb, for herb work, medicinal work, um, and also connection to the dead and ancestors and everything that, you know, shamans do as well. Uh, the thing is, we have a, a clear body count of how many witches were uh, murdered in Europe, but we don't have a clear body count of shamans and people who were uh, men and women who were murdered in the Americas, uh, in all of the places that uh, imperialism and coloniz colonization happened, there were, it was madness. There was absolute slaughter when it came to that. Uh, so we don't have a clear definitive uh, number, but worldwide, a lot of our wise people, wise elders, and usually they were older people, um, in fact, in Europe, it was mostly women who were over the age of, of 40. So it was older women who were, um, were murdered. Uh, we had this going on all over the world to a certain extent. And now the hangover is still here. You know, even in, in the South America, there's a hangover there. The bruja and the witches is considered an evil and a bad thing. I mean, that's cultural... Um, probably a, a cultural conditioning thing because uh, Christianity went in there and said evil. <laughs> Brujas are evil, witches are evil, working with these plants is evil, we're going to change it all around and you're going to start to worship our God. And so, you know, you see the hangover everywhere. So, of course, this word and 
and is given a bad rap. And it doesn't help when we have media and films that help solidify that, you know, like evil witches and, <laughs> and all of these kind of horror movies and whatnot. So everyone's thinking, uh, stay away. Even if you say the word witch, people get their back up. So we're trying to evolve out of this cultural hangover, I believe. And I think just bringing it back to um, the base note of wisdom and a connection to wisdom and holding that wisdom in the vibration of love, not fear, because some will use it for fear because they want to control others and it's for, you know, ego reasons or whatever it is. And uh, stepping back into that, um, I think is a, a process. It's like a reclaiming. It's like uh, reclaiming the word, you know, uh, and um, stepping back into the true nature of the word. And I think uh, working with plants is, um, yeah, a big part of it, a big part of the wisdom. I think uh, it, it goes back to ancient times. Um, what was the other part of your question? <laughs> the, the divination part. Yeah, so divination. So divination is the concept of, of receiving insight and that wisdom I was talking about from seemingly other places. And it's, you know, the ability to have future vision, to precognitively see something, the, be, the ability to look into the deep past to retrieve information about the person, to sit and be with them and, you know, have visions of certain periods of that person's life, to be able to say, oh, uh, when did you get into a, a terrible uh, accident and uh, broke your collar, left collarbone when you were a kid? And they're like, yes, you know, so it's able to access that too. It's able to access uh, information. And so with divination, it's also got a long history of using external tools to help bring about the, the, this state. I think divination is like going back to the brainwave states and the flow state. It's effectively holding that state of awareness, but then there's external tools that you can also use to bring in either synchronicity confirmation or talking points. So people have been using divination tools for thousands of years from bones to stones, to leaves, tea leaves, uh, to, to tarot cards. Tarot cards are another one, rune stones, pools of water, crystal balls, <laughs> you name it. But they're just the scrying mirrors. They're just the external tools that help to, for, you know, almost as a conduit for what's already coming through in a flow state. And I think the external tools are there are more for the other person, <laughs> for their, um, for it to kind of be art articulated in a kind of way. So for example, when I sit down and I do a reading with a person, um, usually before I get into a, a reading, like for with tarot with the client, I will do a meditation beforehand. And in the meditation, I will open space and I'll go, okay, I put myself aside and I'm tuning into that flow state. And while I'm in that flow state, I'll get like loads of different visions, uh, like dreamlike imagery that comes up. I'll also hear things, um, in inside like an internal healing hearing like either names or a sentence and then i'll jot everything down in a in my notebook so before i even connect to the person i've done this process and then when i connect with the person we do an opening meditation and um and get into our session and then i start to pull cards for for the person and now while I'm pulling cards for the person, I also have everything that I've written down. And often when I pull a card, it will correspond a lot with what I already received written down. So it's almost like a synchronicity or a confirmation. So I will bring in the message of the card and I will also bring in all the things that I saw in the meditation before I got into the session. And so that's kind of how divination works. The card is there more for 
the person to trust the process. It's like the external physical uh, symbolic embodiment for the wisdom. I mean, I could just tell them the wisdom just offhand, but it gives it a, becomes a talking point in a way, and it helps in synchronistic ways for the person to trust the process a little bit more, um, mostly because um, it's like we're children, you know, like with kids, they like need flashcards <laughs> and they like things, a story being told to them. It's a bit like that. But that's kind of the process of divination. And you can do that process through many external tools. Uh, and you can do the process with plants. So I was speaking about some of the good plants for divination. This is one of them. I got a few other ones growing behind me. Um, one of them is uh, Kalea Zacatashishi, which, which is a Mexican dream herb. And that's got a long history of use for divination. And I noticed when I work with that plant, uh, I'll definitely that heightens it in dreams, in the hypnagogic, in meditations. Um, there's another one called Sinicoichi, which is also Mexican. It's used by the Aztecs that I have growing back there too. It's got a history of divination. So there's a lot of plants that seem to be able to connect you to this wisdom, uh, the Wicca, the witch. Um, and that's why probably witches and shamans are so associated with uh, working with plants. Uh, and they're like their familiars and taking one step further, also animals, you know, like witches and shamans work with animals too, uh, for also altered states of consciousness through shape sh shifting. Um, and the animals being their like familiars in a way, cats being prolific example with witches, where cats are like an extension of, <laughs> of the, the witches sensibilities and the sensitivities. So through this interspecies relationship with the animal, with the cat, then you can sense and glean things from the cat's consciousness. I know it sounds out there, but this is all symbiotic. We're part of this planet. We're part of nature and plants and animals. And if we can tap into these flow states, we're able to communicate clearly with each other uh, and help each other out, you know? So, so we can help you and me and everyone else. <laughs> well, Tree, we're, I think we're coming up on four hours. Uh, I wasn't expecting it to go that long. <laughs> But this has been amazing. Um, are, are there any topics that uh, that we didn't cover that you'd like to go into? No, I think that's good. I, I, I'm so sorry. It, it was really long, uh, no, but I was kind of waiting for you. This, this has been amazing. <laughs> I think people are going to get a <laughs> people are going to get a, a tremendous amount out of this. Thank you so much for sharing. It's, it's been beautiful, and you you have a beautiful way of, of of kind of relating all of these different topics and and making them accessible and and I think easy to digest and and. Uh, you know, I, I think in that way, you, you are a witch from that real sense of, of wisdom and, and being able to, to, to draw on all of these things and to be able to, to share that. So thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it. Um, that was beautiful. Thank you. Um, and yeah, apologies. That was really long. And I hope you're all right about that. Um, and I hope you have a great day too and enjoy. It looks beautiful there. And I will get down there someday and I'll, I know I will meet you. So <laughs> yeah. that'd be amazing. I, I, I love long podcasts. Uh, they're, they're my favorite. So uh, when, when I get close to four hours, I consider that a success that it went really well. So thank you. <laughs> That's cool. Well, let's keep in touch because I think, um, I, you know, I, I know our paths will cross and I know I'll probably get down there at one point, maybe not this year, but I have a feeling maybe in late 2022. I just just have a hunch. So we'll see how that goes. Um, but we can keep in touch in the meantime and um, uh, been enjoying your channel too. So uh, I'll keep tuning in to the other interviews as well. Yeah, that'd be amazing. And maybe we'll get a chance to meet up uh, with Luis here too. Um, yeah. if, if people want to learn more about you, to, to work with you, to reach out to you, is, is there a way they can do that? You mentioned uh, the, the course you're doing. How would, how would people go about doing that? 
Yeah, so um, I'm pretty accessible because I'm online, uh, you know, listening to ayahuasca and getting <laughs> getting online. So, um, so I'm I'm on Instagram, also Facebook, just as Tree Car. But my website is luciddreamtree.com, and I have a lot of my events and courses up there. Uh, I work quite a bit with the Psychedelic Society UK, uh, doing lucid dreaming uh, group journeys. Uh, at the moment, they're all online because it's the pandemic. But when it was in real life, we we do these courses in real life, and it we top it off with the uh, weekend sleepover, like a retreat. So we work with uh, you know an immersive experience. So I'm very much into the immersive experiences, always doing retreats and uh, into group journeying, group dreaming, and of course working with all of these amazing plants, winerogens that help activate dream states and being close to nature. So that's a big part of my practice too. Um, of course, all my death works up there as well, booking sessions for um, uh, death doula sessions, catharsis sessions for grief. And also I read tarot and uh, do sessions for that as well, for divination. So yeah, whatever tickles your fancy, you can get in touch. <laughs> Well, wonderful. Thank you so much, Tree. That was that was amazing. I, I really enjoyed this, and I, I wish you all the best. And uh, yeah, I would love to cross paths when that's uh, when that when that synchronicity happens. Uh, hopefully, sometime in the near future. Yeah, amazing. Okay, Jason. Thanks so much, and have a wonderful day. You too. Bye. All right, everybody, that's it. I hope you enjoyed that episode with Tree Carr. I really enjoyed speaking with her. Uh, it's probably one of my more interesting uh, episodes of just uh, the variety and, and kind of depth of uh, the topics we talked about. So I hope you all enjoyed that. As always, if you're able to help to support this podcast, that's deeply appreciated by me. Um, a really good way of doing that is via Patreon. There'll be a link in the show notes. It's a subscription service. And uh, for just a small Small amount of money you can sign up for different tiers and with that you get things back like early access to shows bonus material q and a's uh, so that's a really amazing way to help to support this show to help to support me there's also the ability to direct donate via paypal uh, there's also a link in the show notes with that uh, to all the patreon subscribers thank you very much i, I deeply appreciate it uh, all of your support to all the people who donated via paypal thank you very much um, if you're not able to do that simply going on the youtube page and subscribing to the show, turning on the notification bell, liking the video. That's a really big help with the algorithms and getting the show out uh, so that more people are able to see it. And then with the audio version going on Apple Podcasts, also subscribing to the show and leaving a starred rating and a short review. So that's it. Um, I'm not sure the order of the next guest because I've actually shot the last three episodes uh, pretty close together. So I still need to figure out the order of the future shows. But as always, there'll be some really good guests coming on. So thank you all for tuning in and I will see you all on the next episode.